I'll never forget the day it happened. I was visiting the Pike Place Market in Seattle on my way to grab some coffee before heading to work. It seemed like a regular, uneventful morning, except for this unexpected feeling of dread that began to creep up on me. My name is Nathaniel Keybath, of Blackfoot Native American origin, and I work at a software company not too far from the market. Life had been pretty normal for me until that day, which turned everything upside down. As I strolled through the bustling marketplace, I couldn't shake off the eerie atmosphere encompassing the place. It felt as if something sinister loomed around the corner. Trying to ignore the sensation, I grabbed my coffee and bumped into an old friend, Crystal Lamont, whom I hadn't seen in years. We exchanged pleasantries and decided to catch up over lunch later that day. The morning dragged on as my mind kept replaying snippets of our conversation and brainstorming possible reasons behind those weird vibes. During lunchtime, Crystal and I met at a nearby restaurant and started discussing our lives since we'd last crossed paths suddenly. Our conversation took a dark turn when she mentioned a series of brutal murders and sinister, unexplained incidents taking place in this part of town. She told me people were going missing or turning up dead in horrific conditions after encountering a group of kids with soulless black eyes, later nicknamed the Black-Eyed Fiends. Even discussing them made Crystal visibly shaken, which made me believe that these weren't just urban legends. Determining not to be controlled by fear because every crime has an explanation, logical people handle what comes logically with an easy, graceful head nod, but it piqued our adventure-thirsty minds, and we started seeking more information from locals and veterans around the market for any leads or eyewitness accounts. Our findings led us to Anita Moonlight, an old lady who admitted to having seen one of the black-eyed fiends near an alley where we found strange claw-like marks on the walls. All logical reasons faded away as we started questioning the existence of something far beyond the mundane. As days turned into weeks, Crystal and I delved deeper into this macabre investigation and spoke to more people who shared horrifying tales of their encounters with these peculiar kids. As if feeding on a never-ending loop, each testimony added more layers of fear and confusion to our minds. How could these kids possess such terrifying powers to taunt, hunt, and kill their victims? Then, one night while we were returning from a late-night stakeout in the area, it finally happened. Out of nowhere, a group of four emotionless children with black eyes appeared in front of us. We were paralyzed with fear as we recognized them. The black-eyed fiends had made contact. Before we could react, one of them lunged at Crystal and knocked her to the ground. He then viciously assaulted her while others stood next to me, whispering something indecipherable that heightened my senses. With every bone in my body screaming for me to do something and no time left to process what was going on, I picked up a heavy rock and smashed it onto the attacker's head. To my bewildering relief, they stopped everything and disappeared without a trace leaving us gasping for breath in that lonely alleyway. We reported what happened to the police, but they seemed skeptical despite ample evidence, equally confused by those sinister marks etched on every crime scene. A couple of weeks after Crystal's attack, I overheard a conversation between two detectives at a nearby diner discussing an old unsolved case involving kidnapping and subsequent mutilation of children during the 1960s. The mastermind behind the heinous crimes was believed to be a deranged black-eyed kid who was never caught or identified. The cold case had been reopened following numerous, eerie similarities with recent occurrences. Was the kid the same entity still at large, or does this mystery run deeper into the realm of inexplicable horror? The answers remain dark and clouded, leaving us caught in a state of perpetual paranoia, wondering if those emotionless black eyes will somehow find their way to stalk and haunt us again. 
As the memories of that fateful encounter refused to fade, Crystal and I decided to take matters into our own hands. We joined a clandestine group of locals set on unearthing the truth behind the black-eyed fiends and putting an end to their spine-chilling reign of terror. We poured over old newspaper archives, toured haunted locations mentioned in the cold case files, and delved into the history of Seattle, searching for hidden threads that might connect these horrific events. Along the way, we met with like-minded individuals who shared our burning desire to protect the innocent and expose whatever malevolent forces lurked in the city's dark corners. We vowed to stand together and fight this horrifying menace, steadfast in our conviction that we could vanquish these enigmatic beings before they claimed another life. It was 5.13 p.m. on a Friday, and I had just arrived at the popular neighborhood coffee shop in Brooklyn. I needed to unwind after a long week at work, but little did I know that this ordinary evening would escalate into something sinister. The place was packed, but I managed to find a spot by the window, giving me a view of the bustling street outside. I remember thinking about how Kelly, my co-worker, cracked up at my joke earlier, making fun of our annoying manager. We often exchanged friendly banter and made light of our days at work. She was the only one I felt truly understood me. I grabbed my steaming cup of coffee and decided to text her about my plans for the weekend. A group of locals started an animated conversation at the table next to me. As any city dweller would do, I dismissed them as regular neighborhood gossipers until a name caught my attention, Marlon Drakowski. From what I gathered, Marlon was a notorious recluse responsible for a gruesome murder in our town several years ago. My curiosity peaked. I discreetly asked around about Marlon's story and learned that news of his solitary life led to all sorts of wild speculations everything from government conspiracies to underground crime rings. The discussion slipped between fact and fiction for a while before finally settling on another topic, the curious kids with black eyes that appeared to be showing up around town recently. Soon enough, people around me started sharing their encounters with these strange children that supposedly ate pets or hunted in packs. Although alarming, it sounded far-fetched to me until an older man who called himself Craig chimed in with a chilling personal account. He told us about working late one night when he noticed his car being followed by four kids with unnervingly pitched black eyes. Panicked, he had driven faster but couldn't shake them off until they suddenly vanished at a crossroads. He claimed it was a supernatural occurrence that defied explanation. It wasn't long before I found myself neck deep in research on sightings of children with black eyes across the nation. To my surprise, I unearthed a detailed list of events dating back to the early 1980s. Apparently, they were always spotted during the late hours, stalking or terrorizing their victims with unpredictable and violent tendencies. As I scrolled through the unnerving accounts, I experienced the distinct feeling of being watched. I looked out the window and saw the streets bathed in darkness, save for the flickering street lamps that cast jagged shadows on the pavement. Among those shadows stood a little girl wearing an oversized hoodie. Her deep black eyes locked on me as she grinned maliciously. In a panic, I bolted from my seat and toward the back door of the coffee shop. A dense knot of fear tightened in my chest as if restrained by invisible hands. The streets were suddenly filled with whispers of terror spreading about these terrifying black-eyed children. I needed answers. I had to find Marlon Drakowski and confront him about his alleged connection to these menacing figures that haunted our town. 
A chilling sensation crept up my spine as I held on to the chilling realization that we may never truly understand what evil lurks behind those eerie black eyes. My heart raced as I left the coffee shop behind, the chilly night air wrapping around me as I descended into the maze of Brooklyn streets. The quest to find Marlon Drakowski had begun, and with each step, the fear that coursed through my veins fueled my determination to uncover the truth. I knew that pursuing this enigma might put my life in danger, but I couldn't just turn a blind eye to the horrors unfolding around me. Through a series of inquiries and subtle interrogations, I eventually managed to track down Marlon's last known address. It was an old, decrepit house hidden away in a particularly desolate corner of the neighborhood, a perfect lair for someone with a dark past. As I approached the house, I noticed how the shadows seemed to cling to its very foundation, as if it were a malignant entity that repelled all light. As goosebumps crawled up my arms, I knocked on Marlon's door. A few tense moments passed before it slowly creaked open, revealing a stooped figure who cast an ominous gaze upon me. His haggard face was marked with signs of strife and unimaginable secrets, and his eyes gleamed ferociously with unnerving intensity. From the depths of his tortured soul, he recounted his sinister tale, one stained by blood and tragedy, that ultimately led him down this gruesome path. As we delved further into our conversation and the mystery surrounding the black-eyed children deepened, a sudden sense of dread enveloped us both. Unbeknownst to us at that moment, we had unlocked something malevolent from within our innermost fears, something that stalked us like predators in search of prey. The line between reality and nightmare blurred further until we found ourselves unwittingly drawn into their horrifying domain. Now. We stood shoulder to shoulder in our endeavor to fight back against this darkness that threatened to consume our very sanity. In that moment, Kelly in the coffee shop seemed like a distant memory, a polarizing contrast between a simpler, idyllic life and a hellish descent into realms unknown. It all started during my daily jog in Central Park. I had recently moved to New York City for work, and my new apartment had just the perfect location close to the park. I wasn't taking any notice of the time, but with the sky rapidly darkening around me, it was obvious that daylight was waning. The air felt heavy somehow, like the calm before a storm. My name is Mitchell Grayson, by the way. I'm a crime reporter for one of the big daily newspapers around here. You can blame my curiosity for that career choice. Anyway, back to that fateful evening. As I rounded a corner on one of the park's many winding paths, I noticed a small group of children huddled together near a fountain. At first, there was nothing alarming about this scene. Kids playing in the park was pretty standard stuff. Still. Something felt off about these kids. They all shared a peculiarly uniform look, pale skin, neatly combed black hair, and eyes so dark they were practically black holes. I kept moving but couldn't shake a rising sense of dread that seemed to encompass everything around me. The kids followed me with their eyes as I continued my jog, their gazes drilling into me even as I turned away from them. That sinking feeling in my gut only grew worse when I spotted Jenny Fitzgerald talking with her neighbor on their stoop, just a couple blocks away from the park. Jenny had been missing for three weeks now, her face plastered all over town on lost posters, and she looked like she hadn't aged at all during that time period. The shock of seeing her made me stop in my tracks and what really rattled me was watching those same peculiar children emerge behind her with eerie grins on their faces. It all clicked suddenly. Those kids had to be involved in her disappearance. Fueled by adrenaline, 
I followed them as they floated between the light and shadows, their black eyes always watching. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon a gruesome scene where the little monsters began to act. Attacking unsuspecting victims, they displayed terrifying strength, dismembering their prey and leaving a trail of carnage in their wake. The police were finally able to corner the kids in an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. Flashes of gunfire illuminated the darkness as brave officers engaged them in a bloody battle. It was a David and Goliath situation, but somehow, perhaps out of sheer terror or maternal patriotism, the humans emerged victorious. In the aftermath of that horrific ordeal, expert occultist Dr. Alice Fields stepped in to put names to these monstrosities. Derek, Black Eyes, Winter's Lily, Dark Charm, Sullivan and Timmy, Blood Whisperer, Johnson. Together, they formed the unearthly trinity, three souls twisted by dark magic and hellbent on destruction. The city breathed a collective sigh of relief when that night finally came to its devastating conclusion, but we couldn't forget what we'd seen or what those children had done. And for the rest of my days, I'll forever wonder who or what spun their evil into existence in our very midst. The following months saw a city on edge. Parents were holding their children a little tighter, closely watching them during mundane daily outings. Fear was palpable in the air, a dense fog that refused to dissipate. In the wake of the unearthly trinity's reign of terror, authorities undertook thorough investigations, trying to piece together their origin and how such creatures came to exist among us. Dr. Alice Fields spent countless days poring over ancient texts, deciphering code after code in search of a clue that might reveal some answers. As a crime reporter, my responsibility was to document these unsettling developments for the public. But no matter how close I got to the story, it never seemed close enough, like there was always another layer of mystery beneath the surface just begging to be uncovered. Though I tried my best to move on with my life and fulfill my journalistic duties, my life was forever changed by those gory encounters, leaving me restless at night and with only burning questions consuming my thoughts. Where did those children come from? What force brought them into our world to wreak havoc? And worst of all, was this the start of a malevolent infestation or simply an isolated incident? The answer remained elusive, and as time marched on, the lingering shadow cast by the unearthly trinity only grew darker and more foreboding. How is it possible that such a seemingly ordinary day could lead to such a shocking and terrifying experience? My name is Camden Novak, and this is my story, a chilling account of what happened at the once thriving mall in Yorba Linda, California. As a freelance graphic designer, I've always had an irregular schedule. That Wednesday was no different for me. Having finally finished a big project and decided on a more relaxed day, I pulled into the mall parking lot around noon, not knowing that I would stumble upon something so cripplingly terrifying that nothing would ever be the same again. A couple of hours into my shopping spree, I noticed some commotion as people began pulling out their phones to take pictures or record video. In this day and age, the instinct to document every unusual event has become almost second nature. However, even then, something still felt off. For some reason, my instinct screamed not to get too close. The scene unfolding before me can only be described as surreal. A group of three children stood ominously in the center, all with pitch black eyes and vacant expressions. Despite their youthful appearance, there was no innocence or warmth in their faces, only an unsettling aura emanated from them. Knowing better than to get involved, I cautiously backed away, 
but one of them locked eyes with me. Insidious thoughts telling me that these kids couldn't possibly be so sinister clouded my rational judgment momentarily, but they were also what led to my undoing. Before I knew it, they had surrounded me and were speaking in whispers with an urgency that sent shudders down my spine. They demanded access to my car while casually dropping names like Isabel Sanchez and Lucas Kendall, friends from school who they shouldn't have known about. Feeling cornered with no way out and reeking of desperation, I attempted to make a break for it amidst their frantic chanting, only to be grabbed by the one with the coldest gaze. This child, who called himself Ezekiel, had a grip so tight I thought my bones would shatter. It was then that something shifted, sending everyone panicking back to their senses as bystanders called 911. The trio of mysterious black-eyed children vanished in an instant, leaving me gasping for air and in utter disbelief. The investigation that followed yielded no clues, as if these seemingly otherworldly beings never existed. However, I later found out from my friend Isabel that her cousin had also heard of these appearances from other survivors who had narrowly escaped their clutches. To this day, no one knows who or what those children were or how they knew about our lives, whether they were malicious spirits or something more sinister. But one terrifying truth remains, they're still out there, hiding in the shadows, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike fear into the hearts of their victims once again. After that harrowing encounter, my life would never be the same. Sleepless nights plagued me as I constantly jumped at even the smallest of shadows. Fear and paranoia had taken over. Despite seeking therapy and sharing my story with close friends and family, the encounter with those black-eyed children left a lasting impact on me. I became consumed with researching similar incidents, hoping to find some sort of explanation. My research led me down a rabbit hole of paranormal sightings, supernatural beings, and urban legends, each more chilling than the last. Stories of encounters with these enigmatic children spanned countries and decades, sending shivers down my spine as I read through countless accounts. At night, unable to sleep, I lay in bed wondering why these entities targeted innocent people and what it was they truly wanted. As time went on, fear slowly evolved into determination and resolve. I knew that something had to be done in order to protect others from this evil. Bolstered by this newfound purpose, I dedicated myself to uncovering the chilling truth behind these mysterious creatures and their heinous intentions, no matter how far that journey might take me. In sharing our stories, those who had suffered similar experiences found solace in knowing we were not alone in our battles against these otherworldly forces and that together, we might one day lift the veil of shadows that surrounded us and reveal the sinister threat lurking just beyond our perception for all to see. It all started on a typical Tuesday evening. I had just finished up at work and headed out to my favorite bar, the Rusty Anchor. I'd always loved the atmosphere there. It wasn't too crowded, but it had enough regulars to make you feel part of a community. It's one of those popular places in the USA that everyone seems to love. There was this guy, Oswald Foster, sitting at the end of the bar, nursing a whiskey on the rocks. He was new around here, and I thought about introducing myself later on, maybe after a few drinks. Little did I know the terror that was about to unfold. As I took my seat, this woman named Greta Bradshaw caught my eye. She had an intense look, perhaps from years of dealing with a high-stress job or maybe something more sinister. But she was nice enough when we spoke earlier in the week. 
I ordered my usual and started making small talk with Bart, the bartender who had been working here for years. Just as we were discussing yesterday's game and his thoughts on how our team needed a better strategy, two kids walked into the bar. They looked out of place, dressed in old-fashioned clothing with something unnerving about them. Most striking were their eyes. They were completely black. The kids didn't seem friendly or even innocent like children usually do. Instead, they simply exuded malevolence. I couldn't believe what I saw next. These seemingly harmless kids grabbed Oswald by his shoulders and began ripping at his flesh with their bare hands. The screams were deafening. A haunting mix of Oswald's cries and Greta's terrified shrieks echoed throughout the bar. Call 911! I shouted as Bart hurriedly picked up his phone while I tried to intervene. But everything happened so fast that it felt like I couldn't move an inch closer. The other patrons started panicking too. Some tried to run, and some were frozen in fear. By now, Oswald's body was torn apart, and the floor was slick with blood. I felt bow rising in my throat, but I had to push through that fear, that feeling of nauseating dread clawing at my chest. I grabbed a pool cue and swung with all my might at one of those childlike monsters. It had no effect on them. They glanced back at me, grinning viciously with mouths full of twisted, razor-sharp teeth. Then they lunged at Greta. Though her fight was horrifyingly short-lived, she still tried to defend herself, to no avail. Their claws cut through her flesh as easily as butter. I doubled down on mustering every ounce of courage I had left in me. There must have been something we could do. While everyone else was completely incapacitated by panic, another patron, a brave young woman named Zinnia who managed to keep her composure, crawled across the room and yanked the fire alarm lever. Instantly, the sprinklers activated, drenching everything and everyone inside. As if it were the kryptonite, the drenching water made those black-eyed kids falter and eventually retreat out the door. We had been granted a small mercy, however temporary it may have been. Days later, after being treated for minor injuries and speaking with police investigators about our ordeal, Bart told me the horrifying backstory behind those kids. They were known as the black-eyed children. Ruthless killers thought to be mere urban legends until now. He explained that his sources revealed these kids were spotted before increasingly violent incidents in the area over the years but never left a trace that they existed, until now. But even knowing this ominous history did little to appease our lingering fears or answer why they visited us on that fateful night. Even though we survived our encounter with the black-eyed children, our lives were changed forever. I still have nightmares about the attack and am constantly on edge, even in familiar spaces. Now we just pray they never return or seek retribution for the brief victory we achieved that night. Despite the lingering paranoia, we all knew we couldn't let this incident consume our lives. We had to keep living, not just for ourselves but for Oswald and Greta as well. The bar eventually reopened, and the community surprisingly grew closer out of shared trauma. We started holding weekly meetings to discuss any new information or sightings of the black-eyed children and develop contingency plans to protect ourselves and our loved ones. Some people turned to spiritual guidance, while others sought solace in therapy or self-defense training. Bart's once popular bar became a hub of camaraderie and support, with the pain of our shared experience creating an unbreakable bond. Even though we knew there was no guarantee we wouldn't face such horror again, we found strength in each other, and that was something worth holding on to as we navigated the uncertain future together. It started with a joke. 
Yeah, I know what you're thinking. How can a sinister story start with a joke? But that's exactly how it began, right there in the bustling heart of New York City. It was a usual evening after work, and I was out with my friends at our favorite jazz club. Life was simple, and we often indulged in making fun of each other. As we exchanged playful jabs, I noticed a glimpse of fear in my buddy Jarvis' eyes. Or maybe it was just the dimly lit club playing tricks on me. Jarvis, a balding middle-aged man who knew his way around Wall Street, said he'd seen something unusual that week. What he shared sounded almost too absurd to be true. It involved kids with black eyes who seemed to defy logic. But come on, we were a bunch of skeptics who only believed what we saw. You know, those city folks hardened by life who typically brushed off all strange encounters. As the days went by, things took an eerie turn. Little details began to shift, small enough that you almost didn't notice them at first but definitely noticeable when they added up. And they always did. Our suspicions peaked when, one evening, Jarvis didn't show up for our nightly hangout at the jazz club. Worried, I went over to his apartment along with another friend named Foster, who looked like he had come straight out of a biker gang. We found the creaking door strangely unlocked and called out to him as we entered. Staring back at us was something horrible. Jarvis lay face down on his living room floor in a pool of blood, punctured repeatedly by sharp objects too jagged to be called knives. His lifeless eyes stared blankly back at us. I hadn't even known his last name until the police officer told me after taking our testimonies, McCracken. Jarvis McCracken. Our anger and fear grew into a vicious search for the murderers. Led by our own intuition and with the help of mutual friends who knew more about the shady corners of New York City, we sought answers to this gruesome mystery. And indeed, what we ended up unearthing would cement itself within our subconscious for the rest of our lives. The day we got a lead was as ordinary as any other day. Foster, cursing under his breath about his lousy luck at poker the night before, received a mysterious phone call from an informant called Lenny Boyd, a two-bit hustler who frequented questionable places. Partly out of hopes for reward money and partly because he was disturbed by the growing violence, Lenny shared vital information with us. He'd heard people speak in hushed whispers about kids with black eyes, akin to darkness itself, who prowled in the shadows of the city, carrying out unimaginable brutalities. Following this clue to its climax, we found ourselves in an abandoned warehouse wrapped in shadows. As we cautiously ventured inside, we encountered them, those kids with black eyes that Jarvis had mentioned. That moment embedded itself deep within my memory, their eerily calm demeanor glinting against the darkness they wielded like a glove. Their malicious smiles as they toyed with our mortality sent shivers down my spine. In sheer panic and adrenaline pump fury, we fought them off with anything we could find, broken glass, metal pipes, even our bare fists. In that life-or-death struggle, Foster managed to overpower one of them and demand answers. Begging for mercy amidst cries of pain, the child revealed their leader's name, Marlo. No logic or reason seemed to emanate from Marlo or his cursed congregation. They embodied chaos and destruction. Within weeks after that encounter, Hushed gossip transformed into citywide terror as whispers of Marlowe and the black-eyed kids echoed throughout the cold air. Days turned into weeks, and then into months. Foster and I, along with other concerned citizens, eventually managed to expose Marlowe's network of terror. The blood-soaked nightmare came to an end, but the scars etched into our lives would never vanish. To this day, Nobody knows exactly who or what Marlowe was, the elusive figure leading the black-eyed kids, but his name remains etched in our memories, 
a reminder of the horror that once lurked in the shadows. And as we share our past with trembling voices under dimly lit street lights, we can't help but wonder if the malevolence still lingers in some form, waiting for the right moment to resurface. The laughter and joy once shared among friends at the jazz club have long been replaced by cautious glances and lower tones. The city that never sleeps now doesn't dare to close its eyes, having tasted the heart-wrenching fear of the unknown. As for Foster and me, we continue with our lives, having grown wiser but also more wary of the darkness around us. We often find ourselves listening for muffled whispers in the crowded streets and inspecting the shadowy corners, never too certain that Marlowe's evil has truly vanished. Will it ever be the same again? Perhaps not, but one thing is certain. We will always carry with us a reminder of our chilling encounter with Marlowe and his black-eyed kids, a tale that shall forever haunt the hidden alleyways and back streets of New York City. Why this had to happen to me, I'll never understand. It was just another mundane Sunday afternoon in Southern California, the kind where you'd think nothing much could happen. My name's Kellen DeMars. Yeah, I've never met another Kellen either. The only thing different about that fateful day was my sudden urge to visit the old Griffith Observatory. Now see, I'm not a superstitious guy. I've always believed in facts over fantasies. But that day, the day I think changed everything, still sends shivers down my spine. I'm an electrician by trade. I've been doing it for about 17 years now. Work took me all over the place but left enough time for other things. That day, I decided to drive up to the observatory around 3 p.m and spend some time admiring the architecture and catching up on some of the exhibits. Little did I know what awaited me there. It began as a normal visit until, within the observatory's domed room displaying celestial wonders, I noticed a sudden murmur among people standing not far away from me. Following their gazes, I saw three young kids standing at one end of the room. They were dressed in plain black clothes nothing out of the ordinary, except for their eyes. A chill ran down my spine as I saw their eyes, pitch black and vacant, staring at everyone and no one at the same time. For a second there, something primal screamed in the back of my head to run away immediately or risk facing unimaginable horrors. As if reacting to my thoughts, the kids began approaching people one by one, getting too close for comfort and speaking in hushed tones. Whoever they talked to ended up with horrified expressions before scampering off frantically. Curiosity got the better of me as they made their way closer and closer until they finally stood before me. We're hungry, whispered the tallest kid. At just 10 or 11 years of age, he seemed like their leader. We need something to eat. His words left me frozen in place trying to decipher the strange, overwhelming sense of dread emanating from these kids. A couple of minutes later they were gone, as if they had never been here. But the seed of terror had already been planted in my mind. Days went by, but the eerie encounter plagued my thoughts. I met up with my buddy Zack, a cop who knew the ins and outs of this city like no one else. Kids with black eyes, mused Zack, taking a drag from his cigarette. Sounds like something out of a horror flick. But I swear, I've never experienced anything close to it. I said, pleading with him to take me seriously. All right, said Zack, exhaling a cloud of smoke. Let's see what we can dig up. It turns out we found a lot more than we bargained for two missing person reports from the same day I saw those kids. 
both vanishing without a trace after visiting the Griffith Observatory. The cops gave those reports little attention since this wasn't exactly an epidemic. Driven by our curiosity and not wanting to let other people suffer the same fate as those unlucky victims, we started investigating on our own. With each new piece of information uncovered, accounts from locals telling stories about friends gone mad after crossing paths with these black-eyed children, we grew more convinced that these kids were not ordinary kids at all. Fear consumed me. What could I have unleashed upon myself or others by engaging with these ruthless creatures? Digging deeper into their alleged history and origins led us down unsettling paths into urban legend territory. Some claimed they had been around for ages, while others believed them to be victims of curses, born under nefarious circumstances and destined for darkness. It wasn't until weeks later, on one fateful evening, that we found out the name of the leader, Halen. Hearing Halen's name sent a shiver of familiarity coursing up my spine, a feeling mirrored by Zack. The air felt heavy, as if the very revelation held some sinister significance. It was too much to take in. A battle between reason and terrifying reality had begun. Time passed, but neither of us could forget the chilling encounters that shook us to the core. No one knew where those dark-eyed children went or what their motives were, but one thing was certain, this world was now tainted with an ancient evil. Sometimes, on nights when reality seems distant and the air feels thick with foreboding, I catch myself looking over my shoulder, haunted by the memory of black-eyed children and the evil that surrounds them. The life I once knew has become a distant memory replaced by a constant state of uneasiness and the looming question of our own role in these supernatural events. Zack and I continued to search for answers, delving into ancient lore and unearthing texts that others dare not touch. Our journey has taken us far from the familiar streets of Southern California to the darkest corners of the world, where glimpses of unspeakable horrors linger in the shadows. As we unravel the mystery behind Halen and his dark-eyed followers, a feeling of dread gnaws at my heart, wondering if perhaps these forces are always watching, waiting for their moment to strike. And though fear courses through every fiber of my being, there is a determined fire burning in both Zack and me. We will not stand idly by as evil seeks to corrupt our world. Together, we resolve to uncover the truth and put an end to this nightmare once and for all, even if it means facing whatever darkness awaits us at the journey's end. It was a late Friday night in June the last day of my vacation in a small town in Colorado. I sat at a bar with my friend Sam, reminiscing about my old college days. We were two glasses down when our laughter was interrupted by the news on TV. They were reporting a string of wild animal attacks that had occurred around town. We chuckled, believing the report was overblown. The bartender, a middle-aged woman named Meredith, joined the conversation. She mentioned how her neighbor's dog had been mutilated just yesterday. As much as we wanted to ignore it, the eerie vibe around the topic was hard to shake off. My name is Kellen Ross, and I moved out of this town ten years ago. It felt surreal to be back here. Sam and I grew up together in these streets, but our lives took different turns after college. We decided to call it a night when Sam suggested taking a shortcut through the woods, just like old times. As we walked along the gravel path under the moonlit sky, our conversations turned philosophical, with talks about life and death as if it were tempting fate. With no warning, an ear-piercing scream ripped through the air like a chainsaw shredding metal, making us stop dead in our tracks. What the hell was that? Sam yelled. 
I hesitated before answering. I have no idea. On edge, we cautiously proceeded and soon stumbled upon a horrifying scene. In front of us lay a mangled body with deep claw marks across their chest and half-eaten limbs splayed on the bloody grass. The stench of terror churned our stomachs as we backed away from the gruesome sight. Reality dawned on us for the first time. This wasn't some overblown report anymore. Something sinister was lurking nearby. We hurried towards town but heard rapid footsteps behind us. Turning around, there stood two pale-eyed children with small, unnaturally black irises. They looked like ordinary kids at first glance, but the deep scratches on their nails and blood-stained clothes were far from average. What do you want? I growled, struggling to suppress my fear. The child to the left smirked, revealing rows of sharp teeth. Your flesh would be a fine meal. Sam and I exchanged nervous looks when, suddenly, the creatures lunged at us. We dodged, every muscle quivering with adrenaline-fueled determination to survive. There was no time to think. We had to fight these monsters or die trying. During the struggle, I noticed their oddly human names etched on their shirts, Evan and Alice. Who were these beings? Before there was time for contemplation, we broke free and sprinted toward town while they snarled relentlessly behind us. After reaching the safety of a nearby police station, we reported everything with heaving breaths. Officers found it hard to take us seriously until they recognized my name from a decade ago. The investigation unraveled chilling secrets that had long remained hidden. It turns out that Evan and Alice were two siblings who belonged to an ancient demonic family that terrorized the region centuries ago. They had been dormant for ages, possibly due to a lack of prey or some unknown ritual once performed by townsfolk. However, now they had awakened and started feasting on whatever flesh they could get their hands on again. The horrifying truth slowly spread across town like wildfire. Our once familiar neighborhood now felt like a menacing battleground straight out of nightmares. It took months before the nightmare came to an end. The creatures had vanished after leaving trails of bodies in their wake. I never imagined visiting my hometown could turn volatile in such a terrifying manner. The loss of many innocent souls still haunts me to this day an unforgettable memory that serves as a chilling reminder that darkness extends its reach even in the most seemingly innocuous places. Years have passed since that fateful visit, and life has taken its course. Sam and I both moved to different cities, but we never forgot the horror that changed our lives forever. The trauma brought us closer, as we bonded over a shared burden that others might deem unreal. Every now and then, we gather to remember those lost souls that fate has chosen as unfortunate victims. While the town has repaired its physical wounds on the surface, fear and uncertainty still preside over the daily lives of residents like a permanent stain. As for me, I've turned my experience into a mission to uncover the mysteries behind these demonic beings, Evan and Alice and make sure no one else has to suffer what Sam and I endured. Little did I know that diving into this dark world would soon reveal even more sinister secrets lurking in the shadows. The whispers of more monsters spread across my research notebook like a web of undying nightmares, spanning beyond the boundaries of my hometown. The journey ahead was full of unknowns, but it also held the potential to end an era of terror. And so, I pursued this path relentlessly, driven by fear and curiosity, as if these forces were eternally intertwined in an everlasting dance in my restless soul. I still remember that day. It was a hot summer evening, 
and I had just clocked out from my daily shift at that old rundown bar on the corner of Springhurst and Fifth. I'd been working there after losing my job as a mechanic, and let's just say tending the bar wasn't exactly my dream job. My name is Solomon Konevsky, by the way. Born and bred in the heart of New York City, I've seen my fair share of life's gritty underbelly. The sun had set, and night breathed an eerie calm upon the throbbing veins of the city streets. I decided to take a stroll around Times Square before heading back to my cramped little apartment. As I was crossing through Central Park, something fell off. It was empty, with barely anyone around. The chills went up my spine, but I couldn't quite put my finger on why. I heard a crackle like leaves rustling in the wind, but hey, it's just a squirrel, right? Then I heard it again, followed by a voice. Hey, mister, whispered a child's voice from behind me. I turned around slowly to see two kids hidden in the shadow of a tree. They were both wearing hoodies and jeans, looking like any other average children out in the city. One of them stepped out from the shadows, revealing pitch black eyes that sent shivers down my spine. Could you help us find our mom? asked the other one with a smirk on his face. They seemed eerily calm. It didn't match up with their supposed situation. No fear, no panic. My heart raced as I hesitated for what felt like an eternity but eventually said, Uh, sure. The moment those words escaped my lips, I knew something sinister was about to take place. As we walked deeper into Central Park's isolated paths, searching for their supposed, Mom! the black-eyed boys started growing unusually aggressive. They demanded that we change directions and accused me of leading them astray. I tried to remain calm as the situation escalated. When we reached a poorly lit area beneath an old stone bridge, things took a horrifying turn. The youngest child grabbed a steel pipe lying nearby, bashing an innocent jogger in the head until their skull cracked open. Blood splattered everywhere. I was mortified. As one of them proceeded to scoff at their grisly deed, the second child lunged at me. My battle-tested instincts kicked in as I thrust my knee up into his chest before bolting out of there like a bat out of hell. Days later, sweaty and still living with fear embedded in me, I learned at the local liquor store that the boys were named Marlon and Grady Fitchett notorious for being delinquent children who had disappeared months ago without explanation. They were rumored to possess dark psychological tendencies inherited from their drug-addled mother, who suffered from demon-like hallucinations. To this day, I can still hear their chilling laughter echoing through Central Park, as if they know I'll forever be haunted by what transpired that night. The identity of those black-eyed kids may never be revealed, but one thing is painfully clear, evil lurks amongst us in the shadows, waiting for its next prey. Years passed, and the memory of that nightmarish encounter gnawed at me, its claws leaving a scar on my soul that I could never heal. The faces of Marlin and Grady would often appear in my dreams taunting me as they carried out their vile acts with those wicked smiles on their faces. My life changed course as I became increasingly restless. I was determined to put an end to this evil, not just for my own sanity but for the safety of those who could fall into their clutches. I delved deeper into research, looking for answers that could help me extinguish this darkness. I found stories about black-eyed children throughout history around the world, appearances in different cultures and times all sharing a common, chilling theme that chilled me to the bone. The key to defeating them, I discovered, lay in understanding their weaknesses, light and faith. These sinister beings relied heavily on manipulating human emotions like fear and guilt to control their victims. With this knowledge, I began training both my body and mind to become a force against wickedness. 
I quit my job at the bar and dedicated myself fully to my newfound mission of cleansing our world from these evil entities. Over time, word spread of my fight against darkness, and others who had encountered black-eyed children joined forces with me. We formed an underground organization dedicated to rooting out these evil beings from the shadows. We shared stories and information, tracked down potential hotspots where they were more likely to appear, and sought out experts well-versed in combating malevolent paranormal entities. Together, we confronted these monsters that haunted our dreams, casting them back into the hellish abyss using our collective strength and knowledge. Little by little, we gain the upper hand against this malevolence. The damage we have inflicted on them continues to keep them somewhat at bay even today. As each day passes and our cause grows stronger, we work towards erasing one more darkened corner of this world in the hopes that one day, when the time comes for future generations to travel through Central Park, the only sound they will hear is laughter of joy instead of a sinister cackle that holds the power to haunt them forever. I still remember that day like it was yesterday. It happened on a Friday night, right after work. I was meeting up with my buddies at a local bar in this bustling city for some well-deserved drinks. As we caught up and laughed about our everyday annoyances, the usual chitter-chatter of the bar buzzed around us. Now, you might be wondering who I am. My name is Benedict Jarrett, but you can just call me Ben. I'm an ordinary guy with a 9-to-5 desk job as a marketing manager, nothing special. An everyday life filled with family, friends, and the occasional night out we were all at our usual spot when I noticed a group of kids hanging around near the entrance of the bar. There was something odd about them. They seemed weirdly out of place. The feeling of unease started to build inside me as I watched them. As we continued our conversations, I noticed that some of the other patrons had also picked up on the kids' unsettling presence. But instead of doing anything about it, they all took turns to glance at them and then quickly turned away, too uncomfortable to say anything. As time progressed and more drinks flowed, most people had forgotten about those uncanny children, everyone except for me. Suddenly their eerie presence intensified as they walked straight over to our table. A chilling sensation ran down my spine as one of them stepped forward and introduced herself as Elaine Blackwood. Hi there, she said in an unnaturally calm tone. Sorry to interrupt your evening. Elaine's eyes seemed to turn pitch black as she stared into mine, and I felt an indescribable fear gripping my chest. What do you guys want? My friend Rob asked bravely trying to sound tough despite visibly shaking. Oh, just have a little fun, Elaine replied cryptically before looking over her shoulder at her companions. Suddenly, the atmosphere changed, as if someone had flipped a switch. Panic ensued as the kids launched themselves at the bar patrons, their black eyes gleaming with malice. The bartenders tried to maintain order but they were no match for these fearsome beings. I won't go into detail about the gruesome destruction that followed, but suffice it to say, it was unlike anything any of us had ever encountered. Somehow, my friends and I managed to escape the chaos and hide in an alley. Gasping for breath and fighting for composure, we hungrily devoured every piece of information about these black-eyed children, also known as black-eyed kids that we could find online. Sifting through stories and accounts of these supernatural entities preying on defenseless people left us horrified. Days after the incident, while speaking with a neighbor who had lost someone dear in the violent attack at the bar, we learned more about Elaine and her backstory. My neighbor's cousin worked at a nearby school where Elaine used to study. 
It turns out she had been bullied relentlessly by her peers until, one day, she simply disappeared. Whether that dark history has anything to do with those malevolent eyes remains unknown. What I do know is that there's more to this world than meets the eye. Since that horrifying night at the bar, I have never looked at life quite the same way again. The events of that night haunted us for weeks. Our once mundane lives now felt as if they were overshadowed by a looming, inescapable presence, and we couldn't shake the image of Elaine and her black-eyed friends from our minds. Sleep became a stranger as nightmares tormented us, bringing back the gruesome scene of destruction over and over again. What were these black-eyed kids, and why did they choose to reveal themselves to us? Consumed by a burning desire to understand what had unfolded, my friends and I made it our mission to uncover the truth about these horrifying beings. Alongside our research, we began reaching out to others who had encountered similar experiences. We found that more people had crossed paths with the black-eyed kids than we'd initially thought, and their accounts were eerily familiar with the horror we faced. Those who managed to escape these sinister entities shared stories steeped in fear and grief, powerful emotions that united us all. As we delved deeper into the world of the unknown, we couldn't ignore the reality that darkness lurked in every corner of our lives. Our understanding of life as it was had changed, forever imprinted by genuine terror. We knew we were walking on thin ice, investigating forces beyond human comprehension. Still, we pressed forward in our quest for answers, driven by the unshakable feeling that somehow, someway, finding answers would protect us from ever facing such horrors again. But questions remained. Was Elaine a victim-turned-aggressor? Why and how did she come back with black eyes and a thirst for vengeance? And most crucially, would she seek us out once more? Time would only tell if we were falling deeper down a rabbit hole or inching closer towards understanding these chilling enigmas. One thing's clear, though, since that unforgettable night with Elaine and her dreadful companions, life will never be the same. It all started on a seemingly normal Tuesday night. I was hanging out with my friends at Murphy's, one of those low-key pubs in a small New England town. A solid spot to grab a beer and catch up with your buddies after a long day. We were sitting at our usual table in the back corner, laughing and reminiscing about old times. My name is Reagan Cole, by the way. I'm a 29-year-old technical support engineer working for a local software company. Nothing is too luxurious, but it pays the bills. My friends Jason and Heather joined me tonight. We've known each other since grade school. Jason teaches mathematics at the local college, while Heather is a nurse practitioner at the town hospital. We were about a pitcher deep when we overheard someone talking at the bar. It was hard not to. He was loud and agitated, his hands flying as he spoke to another bar patron. The guy he was talking to glanced over his shoulder at us several times, clearly seeking an escape. Feeling curious, I walked over to order another pitcher and eavesdrop on their conversation. And they were just kids, man. Kids with these soulless black eyes, like something straight out of hell. The agitated man yelled, obviously shaken by whatever experience he'd had. He introduced himself as Marcus Thompson, a frequent traveler who got lost near our town after some car troubles. Existing chatter in Murphy's died down as everyone took an interest in Marcus' story. He continued, It's dark. I can't see much. Then suddenly, there's this messed up noise coming from the woods an unholy ruckus like nothing before. Marcus explained that these creepy, black-eyed kids emerged from the shadows, 
their white teeth eerily visible as they grinned menacingly. Nobody could look away as Marcus recounted how these kids attacked him, ripping at his clothes and skin with unnaturally sharp claws. He managed to break free and hide in his car, calling the police as blood streamed from his fresh wounds. The police arrived and found no trace of the kids, chalking it up to a wild animal attack. But Marcus knew better and vowed never to return. His story left Murphy's patrons uneasy yet captivated. Over the next couple of days, more people around town whispered about these black-eyed kids. People felt nervous and anxious. Something rotten seemed to lurk around every corner. Fear lurked in our hearts. Everyone was on high alert. On Friday, a man named Larry Davenport, an off-duty cop, was found mauled and half-eaten behind a grocery store. There were no clues or suspects, just those haunting stories of black-eyed children ringing in our ears. People started panicking and believing Marcus' tales of murderous kids with dark eyes and sinister smiles. Parents pulled their children from school, barricading their homes against potential attacks. Suspicion grew within our tight-knit community. It wasn't until after Larry's funeral that speculation turned to action. Something had to be done about these black-eyed monsters roaming in the darkness. Jason took charge, using his analytical mind from years of math tutoring, to meticulously map out reported sightings and dodgy encounters around town. He theorized they were using the dense forest as cover and likely had a lair within its depths. We gathered weapons like hunting rifles, machetes, and even makeshift flamethrowers, preparing ourselves for whatever combat came our way. Our eclectic group moved cautiously through the forest, branch by branch, shadow by shadow, our senses sharpened by sheer adrenaline. Finally, in the heart of the woods, we discovered what we assumed was their lair, a derelict house with long, forsaken windows that stared vacantly into your soul. Jason lit a makeshift Molotov cocktail into flames, hurling it towards the wooden hellhole we figured housed our supernatural adversaries. Visceral screams echoed throughout the forest as the house burned brightly, casting malformed shadows on the decaying foliage that surrounded it. Was it their cries of agony, or innocent victims whose lives we failed to save? Days went by, but no more black-eyed kids sprung from the darkness as they did before our pyrotechnic intervention. The people's eyes softened, and a welcomed cautious optimism took root. This unknown terrorist presence seemingly evaporated before us, or so we desperately hoped. A week later, I was at the local library looking up legends and folklore tied to our experience when old Mrs. Harrington, the town's librarian, approached me. She handed me a worn-out book titled, Dark Tales of New England, and told me that it had been passed down in her family for generations. Intrigued, I thanked her and began leafing through the yellowed pages. There, on page 47, was a chilling story eerily similar to what our town had experienced an account from the 1800s describing black-eyed children who would appear in towns all across New England, disappearing as mysteriously as they arrived. The more I read, the more I was convinced that we had not seen the end of these creatures. I shared my findings with Jason and Heather, who agreed that we should remain vigilant and continue researching possible ways to handle this otherworldly threat. Our research led us down a rabbit hole of supernatural theories and conspiracy forums, consuming evenings we would have otherwise spent at Murphy's. The town settled back into its normal routines, but an unspoken doubt lingered beneath the surface. Yet no further incidents occurred, until one day after work, when a pale woman bumped into me in front of our local coffee shop. As she hurriedly apologized with an uneasy smile, I couldn't help but notice her strikingly black eyes. She disappeared into the crowd before I could react, 
leaving unanswered questions in her wake. As autumn turned to winter and frost gripped New England's landscape under its icy claws, our investigations took on newly urgent undertones. What were these black-eyed creatures? Why had they targeted our town? Most importantly, how could we protect ourselves if and when they returned? The answers remained elusive as ever as we continued our quest for truth while shrouded in secrecy. How do you explain to those around you that monsters disguised as children might be lurking just around the corner? I never liked that damned forest in the backyard of my home. I mean, sure, it's a popular spot for tourists during the fall season with its beautiful changing leaves and hiking trails. But every time I looked out my window at night, it felt like there were a thousand eyes staring back at me. Little did I know how true that feeling would become. My Saturday started like any other, waking up late, brewing coffee and sitting on the porch to sip my caffeine in peace. I'd say my life was about as average as it gets. My name's Jackson Calderon, by the way, an IT technician and outdoor enthusiast from a small town in Maine. It wasn't until noon that things started getting weird. My dog, Chewbacca, or Chewy for short, raced to the edge of the woods and began growling and barking like crazy. This wasn't typical Chewy behavior. He usually just chased squirrels or sniffed around for interesting scents. I shouted to him to come back, but it was like he didn't hear me. Concerned, I ventured into the woods to get him. There were always stories about coyotes or bears wandering around these parts, but what caught my eye wasn't an animal. As I stepped deeper into the forest, I realized there was a child staring at me from behind a tree. The kid had jet black hair framing an unnervingly pale face, but that wasn't what sent shivers down my spine. It was his eyes, black as coal, vacant, and menacing. Are you lost? I asked cautiously, trying not to let fear creep into my voice. Suddenly. Chewy stopped barking and returned to my side with his tail between his legs. The boy didn't answer but continued staring at me from his hiding spot. More nervous than concerned now, my mind raced with all the terrible possibilities of having encountered a child like this in the woods. Was he the missing kid from the news last week? How did he get all the way out here? Suddenly, another kid appeared identical to the first one, black-eyed and eerie. It felt like getting blindsided by a freight train filled with nightmares. These kids had an inexplicable aura around them, an unmistakable evil. Don't go, one of them said, his voice eerily devoid of emotion. You should stay and play with us. No, I need to go home. I replied as calmly as possible though my racing heartbeat probably gave away my fear. You don't understand, added the other boy. You won't be leaving, ever again. My instincts screamed at me to run, so I grabbed Chewy and bolted back toward my house. The two boys began pursuing me, never running but appearing closer every time I looked back. They seemed to defy all natural logic and reason. I reached my back door just in time to slam it shut and lock it behind me, but that sense of impending doom still hung over me like a fog. Panic calls to law enforcement led to a dead-end search for these black-eyed kids. Were they some kind of demonic entity wreaking havoc on our small town? Did they have more sinister motives? As the days turned into weeks, Whispers circulated about these dark-eyed monsters hungering for human flesh or worse. My new reality was plagued by questions and fear, with no clear answers in sight. One thing was certain, those boys were out there, waiting for their next victim. 
It wasn't until a chance encounter at the local bar that I learned more about these disturbing creatures. That is, if you're willing to believe old Bobby Jenkins, who had consumed his fair share of liquor that night. He claimed they were known as black-eyed children and had been terrorizing communities for decades. Whether they were malevolent spirits or something more sinister, he couldn't say. Whatever their true nature, I knew one thing for sure. If our paths ever crossed again, I wouldn't be sticking around to find out. Despite Bobby Jenkins' state of inebriation, what he told me at the bar gnawed at my conscience. I found myself unable to sleep and compelled to scour the internet for any information on these mysterious black-eyed children. The more I read, the more I realized that there were countless similar encounters people had reported, some stretching back decades, maybe even centuries. It seemed that most people who met these entities survived their brushes with terror, but others were not so lucky. The thing I couldn't understand was their purpose. Did they simply exist to torment the living, or were they harbingers of something much worse? Every fiber of my being screamed at me to leave town, take Chewy, and flee as far as possible from those damned woods, but another part wanted answers. This need for understanding soon consumed my life as I obsessively dug through news archives, paranormal forums, and obscure old books on folklore. It wasn't just about me anymore. I felt responsible for protecting my community from these beings that haunted our quiet town. With every passing day, I grew more determined to confront them again and put an end to their reign of terror. Armed with knowledge and a newfound resolve, I made a plan to lure the black-eyed children back into the open and hopefully vanquish them once and for all. As dusk settled over my quiet street one brisk October evening, I whispered a silent prayer for strength and steeled myself for whatever dark forces awaited me. Tonight was the night, a confrontation that would hopefully dispel any lingering fear within me, though deep down, a part of me knew this gamble might be my ultimate undoing. It was just another night at Murphy's Pub, an old establishment nestled in the heart of Chicago. I, Connor Hawthorne, had always enjoyed the atmosphere. It reminded me of simpler times. As I sipped my whiskey, the door creaked open. A pale-faced boy with solid black eyes shuffled in, appearing to be dazed or in some kind of trance. The patrons murmured uneasily. But everyone ignored him as he took a seat at the far end of the bar. Gavin, my best friend since high school and fellow regular at Murphy's, joined me at my table. We chatted about our day and shared easy banter, feeling comfortable within these familiar walls. On occasion, though, I couldn't help but glance over at the strange boy with those chilling black eyes. The night wore on and people started to leave the pub one by one until it was closing time. Gavin and I said our goodbyes, and I went to pay our tab while he stepped out for a smoke. I couldn't help but strike up a conversation with the bartender, Maxine, about the odd boy who was still sitting ominously at the bar. She said he'd only ordered water all night and hadn't uttered a single word. As I walked towards the exit, curiosity got the better of me. I approached him and asked if he was okay or needed help getting home. He looked up slowly, and his chilling gaze met mine for just a moment before he whispered something incoherent and left abruptly without another word. I thought little of it until a week later, when strange things started happening in town. People began vanishing, Friends and family members disappeared without any explanation or traces left behind. In my relentless search for answers, I stumbled upon an online forum dedicated to similar events taking place in small towns across America, each marked by sightings of children with black eyes just before tragedy struck. 
Desperate to prevent further harm, I started an independent investigation, diving deep into public records and archives for any possible connection or pattern between these incidents. During my research, I found a centuries-old document bearing the faded image of a boy eerily similar to the one I'd encountered at Murphy's. The author spoke of a malevolent group of beings disguised as children. They hunted in small numbers, infiltrating communities and breaking them apart. The document contained no more information. Their origin remained a mystery. Armed with this terrifying knowledge, I started warning people about the black-eyed children. Most dismissed me as a conspiracy theorist until reality caught up with them. One by one, town members fell prey to those sinister children, some becoming violent or deranged themselves after resisting the whispered words that seemed to slither like tendrils into their very souls. I felt compelled to stop them at any cost. So Gavin and I formed an alliance of survivors, gathering information and sharing ways to fight back against these supernatural predators. Our meetings often took place in the now seldomly populated Murphy's Pub. Soon after devising our countermeasures, I had another encounter with the black-eyed child. This time he locked his gaze on me before uttering my full name with an icy grin. I couldn't fathom how he knew that. The tendrils of paranoia gripped me tightly as I left the pub that night. It wasn't until weeks later that another member of our group encountered one of their own, who explained that they were not some malevolent supernatural entities but rather lost souls twisted by dark forces beyond our understanding. Their blood-curdling appearance betrayed their craving for escape from their tormentor's grip. Unfortunately, Finding this out didn't make them any less dangerous or easier to handle. It simply added a new layer of tragedy to our harrowing struggle. With each passing day, fear and confusion continued to grip our little town. As we faced these predators who simultaneously longed for salvation and threatened our world, I realized that not every horror we encounter in this life can be escaped or understood. Some remain a haunting mystery forever lurking in the shadows. Our small band of survivors continued to gather and exchange information, but with each passing day, we grew more weary and disheartened. We found solace in each other's company at Murphy's Pub, the one place that still felt like a refuge amid the chaos. People from neighboring towns who had experienced similar horrors began arriving, seeking answers, and sharing their experiences. The stories were all hauntingly familiar, a confirmation of the darkness that was seeping into our lives. As a ragtag group of misfits bound by a terrible truth, we fought fear and despair to protect what remained of our homes and families. We delved deeper into history, rituals, and legends, searching for any means to fight back or halt the spread of this malevolence. Eventually, we stumbled upon an obscure collection of ancient scrolls that described incantations capable of banishing dark forces. Although they came with a dire warning that performing them could have catastrophic consequences. Out of options and exhausted from sleepless nights spent standing guard against the black-eyed children, we decided to attempt these dark arts. Together, we formed a circle in Murphy's pub and chanted the words written on those age-old scrolls as candles flickered ominously around us. What happened next is something I will forever struggle to comprehend. A whirlwind of otherworldly energy swirled in the center of our circle, accompanied by ear-piercing wails and tenebrous shadows. The air grew colder as echoes of tormented screams filled our ears. It felt as if every ounce of hope was being drained from our souls. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, it came to an end. Our group scattered in fear and confusion. Some muttered prayers for forgiveness while others simply wept uncontrollably. In the end, whether our desperate actions tempered the darkness or only delayed it remains uncertain, much like the enigma we faced remains unsolved. 
But what I cannot ignore is the bond we forged through this harrowing experience, which has left us forever connected, making the depths of humanity's potential for resilience in the face of even the darkest nightmares ever more apparent. How is it possible that such a normal day could transform into something so twisted? My name is Aldridge Cronin, and I'm going to tell you an unforgettable story, but let me give you some background first. Born and raised in Sandpoint, Idaho, I've been living a pretty mundane life as an insurance claims adjuster. My wife, Nellie Harper, is the one who keeps me sane after long days at the office. It was a supposedly ordinary Wednesday afternoon when it all began to unravel. I was driving to Nate's diner on my lunch break since their weekly special was simply irresistible. As I pulled into the parking lot, a kid caught my attention. He had his back turned to me, standing near the entrance. There was something odd about him that I couldn't quite put my finger on, but I shrugged it off as nothing important. At Nate's counter, I struck up a conversation with the waitress about our town gossip. She mentioned that a guy named Earl Bevington was found dead last week in gruesome circumstances and was buried two days ago. Though I didn't know Earl personally, something sparked my interest in his death. As I ate my meal and continued our conversation about Earl, we saw three other kids passing by the diner window each with pitch black eyes. They paused for a moment and stared right into my soul before continuing down the street. Later that evening at home, Nellie informed me she spoke with her friend Ivana, who worked at the corner store inn. One of their guests had gone missing just before dawn a few mornings before under mysterious circumstances. The guest's roommate claimed he'd seen those same kids with black eyes lurking near their room before they disappeared. Now genuinely concerned, I did what any reasonable person would do. I researched these black-eyed children further online before going to work in subsequent days. From countless encounters recounted on various forums, I found that interactions with them typically ended in misfortune or death. People theorized that these kids were either malevolent beings or death omens. One supposed eyewitness shared a tip in their posts, avoid making eye contact or allowing them to touch you at any cost. Though my skeptical nature doubted the credibility of these forum dwellers, something deep within me began to understand the genuine fear they'd experienced. I felt it too. The following week was uneventful and I started to believe that our town had returned to normalcy. But then Thursday night came around. Nellie was working late at her job as a music teacher, so I decided to spend my evening at Ernie's bar. As I nursed a drink and talked with the bartender about the recent slew of creepy occurrences, an icy chill crept down my spine. Through the dim lights of the bar, I noticed a hooded figure sitting on the opposite side of the room nursing what appeared to be a coke. My paranoia finally got the best of me, so I approached and found myself looking directly into one of those black-eyed children. Before I could react, he shot up from his chair with an unnatural speed that even the most skilled Olympic athlete couldn't achieve. The kid snatched my arm tightly, and I felt weaker by the second as he stared into my very core. Panicking and remembering what I'd read online, I shoved him hard, freeing myself from his grip. After running out of the bar, only then did I realize everyone inside was motionless during my encounter with the black-eyed child. By some miracle, I managed to go home without any permanent injury, but I still suffered weeks of sleepless nights filled with nightmares. With Nellie's support and thorough investigation by local law enforcement and former acquaintances of Earl Bevington's family, we discovered that Earl had gotten mixed up in paranormal and nefarious activities, 
connecting him to the black-eyed children. The town would never be the same. But today, even as I write this, I still don't know who or what they are or where they come from, and I'm not sure if we'll ever get those answers. All that remains are the scars on our souls and a promise to ourselves that we will never let our guard down again, knowing that these black-eyed kids could return at any moment. Months passed, and life started to slowly regain a sense of normalcy. Nellie and I grew closer than ever, finding solace in each other's company amid the chaos that consumed Sandpoint. People in town gradually stopped talking about the black-eyed children, even though their presence still lingered in the back of our minds. The local authorities launched investigations but found no evidence or leads that helped unravel this supernatural enigma. I decided to dig further, driven by my determination to protect my wife, myself, and our community from potential dangers. I joined online forums dedicated to the paranormal, contacted experts in the field, and even attended town hall meetings to discuss these mysterious beings with concerned locals. One evening, while sifting through old newspapers in our local library's archives, I stumbled upon an article from the early 1900s about similar sightings and incidents involving black-eyed children. This discovery confirmed that whatever was happening now had happened before. We weren't isolated in our experiences. As I continued to research and communicate with people who had endured similar encounters, I slowly developed a delicate blueprint for possible defenses against these entities. From various accounts and testimonies collected worldwide, it seemed that certain symbols, rituals, and spiritual practices might offer protection from these ominous beings. Thus began our journey of spiritual awareness and preparedness by creating a safe haven within our home as a sanctuary against any malevolent force. For years now, Nellie and I have lived cautiously yet harmoniously side by side with this unknown reality. Our town has never fully recovered from the scars left behind by those soul-piercing, black-eyed children. Still, we stand united and vigilant in preventing their return to our lives, or at least minimizing their dreadful impact. While we may never fully comprehend the nature or origin of these malevolent entities, their existence continues to serve as a stark reminder that there are forces beyond human comprehension roaming our world ominously, some malevolent in ways we cannot fathom. Our story serves as a cautionary tale for you, the reader, to be prepared, stay safe, and always trust your instincts when faced with the inexplicable and mysterious. I was sitting at my favorite spot in Jimmy's diner, nursing a cup of coffee, when my phone buzzed with a new text message. It was from my old college roommate, Rob Kensington. He'd moved to Texas for work, and we hadn't seen each other in years. The message read, Hey man, I'm in town for a conference. Are you free to catch up tonight? I agreed to meet him for dinner and suggested the diner as our hangout spot. Growing up in a small town, you'd get to know almost everyone around you. My whole life, I considered myself pretty lucky. I lived in one of those rare tight-knit communities where people cared about each other and looked out for one another. We met up later that night at the same booth I had sat at earlier. Rob looked even more tired than the last time I saw him, but he was still the same old, playful guy I remembered from our college days. We spent hours reminiscing about old friends and telling stories of our post-graduation adventures. Do you remember that time we snuck into the abandoned house down by Elm Street? He suddenly asked me, a sly smile curling around his exhausted face. That house had been a source of stories and rumors ever since local teenage boy Jesse Murdoch disappeared years ago after playing there on a dare. Of course, 
I replied. I still have nightmares about that place. Rob finished his beer and told me that he had a story to share, one that he'd only heard whispered after he moved to Texas. But first, he wanted me to promise that if something ever happened to him, this story needed to be heard. His tone shifted unexpectedly. I thought maybe he was playing around or trying to scare me like we used to do back in college, but there was a fear in his eyes that made me uneasy. I hesitantly agreed to keep his story secret until the day he gave me a signal. He began to tell me about Sandra Mathis, a woman he had met at work, with a terrifying tale. She claimed that her son, Aiden, had encountered something sinister in their neighborhood not long after moving to town. One evening, Aiden was in their backyard playing with his toy airplane when Sandra noticed strange black-eyed kids next door. The kids stared at Aiden without blinking, and when Sandra tried to intervene, they simply vanished. Aiden had nightmares for weeks about the black-eyed kids and their hunger for the life within him. Things only grew stranger in the Mathis house. They experienced unnerving poltergeist activity and sudden overwhelming feelings of dread. Soon the family's dog went missing, followed by other pets in the neighborhood. After doing some research at the local library, Sandra linked the black-eyed kids to several reports of paranormal activity throughout history. But nobody could figure out what they were or why they attacked certain individuals. It became an obsession for her, and as Rob shared Sandra's story with me, he admitted that he feared he would be next. The mood in the diner changed as Rob's story unfolded. The air felt heavier and I found myself glancing over my shoulder more often. After discussing further steps to take regarding this bizarre situation, Rob headed back to his hotel, and I returned home. Two days later, I received another text message from Rob. It was just an emoji, a red flag. When I tried calling him several times throughout the day with no success, my heart raced as I remembered our conversation at Jimmy's diner. In his final moments before disappearing into thin air like Jesse Murdoch all those years ago, Rob thought of our deal and sent me that emoji. I realized then, as I'm realizing now, that by sharing Rob's story here on a platform like YouTube, I take the risk of exposing the black-eyed kid's mystery for those who dare to look and await with terror to see what may come. In the weeks that followed Rob's disappearance, I became consumed with the task of sharing his story and continued to investigate Sandra Mathis' claims. The more I dug into the mystery surrounding the black-eyed kids, the more inexplicable encounters surfaced in various communities around the world. People shared their personal experiences involving sinister children with pitch black eyes who seemed to induce overwhelming fear and foreboding without a word. As my research deepened, I found obscure references in old texts suggesting these malevolent beings had been present for centuries, operating under various names and striking dread into those unfortunate enough to come into contact with them. Fueled by loss and driven by an overwhelming conviction to reveal what was lurking in the shadows, I engaged with online forums and sought out others who had witnessed or encountered these terrifying children. Despite our collective efforts, we struggled to find any definitive answer or explanation for their existence. Those who had encountered them would often speak of manipulation and mind control as if these entities wielded an unseen force that could turn even the sanest minds mad. Eventually, my pursuit led me down several dark paths, only materializing more questions than answers. As months turned into years, I felt a gnawing persistence emanating from those haunted black eyes that still seemed to watch me from every shadowed corner of my life. Whether driven by divine providence, or just a desperate need to save myself from this isolating obsession, I knew it was time to compile everything I'd learned over the years and to reach out across networks of researchers, survivors, 
and brave souls willing to explore what malignancy lurked among us, entities whose very presence shattered our understandings of reality. So now here I stand, sharing Rob's story and diving headlong into an abyss of human history filled with legends of malevolent beings that prey upon our deepest fears. As unsettling as it is captivating, exposing this mystery pulls me further in with every passing moment. I know there are risks involved in bringing these dark entities to light, but with each person that hears Rob's story and understands the danger, perhaps we can find a way to stand against it, together. For now, that sliver of hope is enough to keep me pushing forward into the unknown. I never could have imagined that a simple night out with friends would turn into a nightmare. It started like any other Friday night. We decided to meet up at the local bar in our small town in the Northeast US. It was the kind of place where strangers quickly became friends and everyone knew your name. As Simon, Rose, and I were laughing, joking, and enjoying our drinks, a bizarre sense of unease washed over me. I glanced around the room until my eyes landed on a young boy standing in the shadows by the pool tables. He had an unsettling presence about him. Something just seemed off. After a few minutes, he approached us. Hey, he said, his voice emotionless but steady. Do you guys mind if I join you? My name's Markel. Simon, being his usual friendly self, waved him over without hesitation. Sure, man, Markel said, pulling up a chair and settling down with us at our table. But as we tried to engage him in conversation, it felt like talking to a brick wall. Something about this newcomer felt cold and distant. The evening wore on when we noticed the sound of sirens approaching our modest little bar. Curiosity overtaking us, we ventured out into the parking lot to see what was happening. Our jaws dropped as we stared in disbelief at the horrific scene unfolding right before our eyes. Police cars were strewn all over the place, their lights flashing against several mutilated bodies on the ground. Panic set in as we realized that there was no logical explanation for what we were witnessing. I turned around frantically, searching for Markel only to find him standing directly behind me, his eyes pitch black like an abyss from which no light could escape. My heart was racing thinking about how we didn't know anything about him. As more details emerged from the chaos outside our bar's doors, we discovered that all of those attacked had been with us just moments before. A cold chill ran down my spine as I realized that Markel was not responsible for the carnage. Over the next several days, we followed the news religiously, searching for answers that would shed light on Markel's true identity and the events that transpired that Friday night. It wasn't until I attended a town hall meeting that I stumbled upon the truth. Markel was part of an unspeakable urban legend that haunted our small town. Black-eyed children, known to cause fear, panic, and sometimes even death in those who crossed their paths. Now, years after those horrifying events took place, I still can't help but think about the mystery surrounding Markel and how easily he infiltrated our lives. The uneasiness will never cease as the unanswered questions linger in my mind. Who are those black-eyed children? Why did they target us? And most importantly, are they still lurking in the shadows, waiting for their next victims? Despite the lingering fear, life eventually moved on. Our once close-knit group of friends drifted apart, the weight of that night burdening our relationships with a kind of terror that we could never quite escape. However, I never stopped looking for answers. Eventually, I managed to find a community of people who had encountered these black-eyed children themselves, sharing stories and experiences eerily similar to my own. 
On the brink of madness and despair, I forged friendships with others who were desperately trying to make sense of the darkness they had experienced. We pooled our resources together and researched relentlessly, determined not to succumb to the paranoia and fear that clung to us like a heavy fog. In time, we uncovered numerous accounts of black-eyed children from all over the world, dating back centuries. The unexplained phenomenon struck an unsettling chord and often left victims traumatized for life. As we dug deeper, we began to unravel connections between these mysterious entities and different cultures' legends surrounding malevolent spirits, or beings, jinn in Islamic folklore, changelings in European mythology, and countless others. These discoveries helped us understand that whatever Markel had been that night, whether an iconic figure tied to ancient superstitions or perhaps something entirely new, was not unique to our town. It was part of a larger pattern of unexplained terror inflicted on humanity throughout history. But with this knowledge came another chilling realization. Despite our efforts, no one had ever succeeded in preventing these creatures from reappearing or stopping their sinister agenda. And so we continue our search for answers even today, knowing that our purpose may be more about finding solace within ourselves than protecting others from these enigmatic horrors lurking just outside the boundaries of human understanding. I just finished my shift at the warehouse on the outskirts of town. It was around 10 p.m. by the time I left, and I decided to stop at the gas station for a quick snack. Everyone knew this place. It was practically an icon in our little town. As I walked in, I noticed there were a few other customers browsing or chatting casually, just like you'd expect on a typical Tuesday night. Everything seemed normal until it wasn't. I grabbed a bag of chips and a soda, heading towards the counter. Behind it stood Kevin Berkowitz. We used to go to school together back in the day. He smiled as he scanned my items. Our conversation was light, and we caught up on life since graduation. Suddenly, amidst our chit-chat, the sound of shattering glass interrupted us. A beer bottle had fallen off of the shelves and broken on the floor. Damn kids! Kevin muttered under his breath as he hurriedly went to clean up the mess. He told me about a group of troublesome youngsters he noticed recently hanging around, all with pitch black eyes that seemed to swallow any light that tried to enter them. I stepped outside and lit up a cigarette while I waited for him to finish cleaning. In the darkness, I could see some shadows lurking near one of the cars parked along the side of the gas station. To be honest, I thought it was just my mind playing tricks on me until one of them started moving, sluggishly yet deliberately. My curiosity peaked, and I walked closer to get a better look at them. As I approached with caution, it became apparent that there were three members in this group all with those mysterious black eyes Kevin had mentioned earlier. Illuminated by my flickering lighter, I struggled to make out their facial features but could see malevolent grins plastered across their faces. Why don't you come closer? One of them asked in a raspy voice, and there was immediate agreement from the others. I felt chills run down my spine as I backed away slowly. As the days went on, more people in town began to report seeing these black-eyed kids. They were never violent at first. They just followed people around or stared at them from afar with their soulless gaze. But then things took a turn for the worse. When Susan Van Eyck, an elderly lady who lived alone on Main Street, went missing, it wasn't long before rumors spread that these strange kids had somehow been involved. The suspicion was confirmed when Mike Ashburn, a police officer,
caught the young terrors fleeing from her house during his routine patrol and ended up in a high-speed pursuit after he discovered Susan's mutilated body inside her home. It was clear now that our town had become infested with something terrible straight out of our worst nightmares. There seemed to be no logical reason for these evil beings to target our quiet community, yet here they were. Panic soon gripped residents as more gruesome acts were reported, seemingly at the hands of these menacing black-eyed kids. Meanwhile, I had been digging deeper to find out who they were and where they had come from. That's when I stumbled upon Joseph Osterman, an older gentleman who frequented the public library. He shared with me that a similar phenomenon had occurred somewhere in Europe back in the early 1900s implying that these creatures might have existed for centuries. At this point, my biggest question was, Why us? What attracted them to our little town? As the months passed by and more lives were lost or permanently scarred by these violent creatures, it became obvious that no one would ever know who or what they truly were or why they had singled us out for their torture. In the end, our town slowly descended into chaos and despair, just as they wanted it to. As I recount this experience to you, I do so with no answers and only one lingering desire, for some semblance of normalcy to return. But in the meantime, the terror of the black-eyed kids continues to haunt us. Seeing the destruction that had befallen my once peaceful town, I knew that we couldn't let this continue any longer. It was time to fight back. Determined, I banded together with a group of fellow townspeople who shared the same drive to protect our home and our families. We called ourselves the Sentinels. Our numbers grew as more people joined our cause, and we began researching and gathering information about these black-eyed kids. With each passing day, we uncovered more horrifying accounts of their atrocities in different parts of the world throughout history, fueling our desire to put an end to their reign of terror. Long nights were spent strategizing and preparing for the inevitable confrontations to come. We knew that capturing or eliminating even one of these creatures could give us an upper hand in understanding their weaknesses. As the Sentinels patrolled the streets at night, and fortified our town against potential attacks, it became evident that the black-eyed kids had noticed. Their sinister grins turned deadly as they stepped up their heinous activities, now targeting not just individuals but whole families. But we would not be deterred. Amidst the mounting fear and a feeling of hopelessness that gripped the town, Courage began to spread like wildfire among the residents as they took up arms against these mysterious invaders. Every person in the town found a role to play. Some would provide medical assistance to those injured in skirmishes, while others would supply food, shelter, and moral support for those affected. It was during this intense struggle that I met a young woman named Emily Hansen, a brilliant scientist who'd been investigating the black-eyed kids herself. Together with her advanced knowledge and our bravery, we were able to uncover that these creatures fed on fear, explaining why they targeted us in our most vulnerable moments. Armed with this revelation, we began developing tactics that exploited their own fears, driving them back slowly but surely. The tide began to turn in our favor and the once invincible black-eyed kids started to falter. Though the battle was far from over, we finally had the means to fight back and restore our town, rebuilding our lives one day at a time. It was the strangest thing, really. I didn't notice them at first. I just thought they were some kids hanging around the park at night. There we were, a group of friends on a warm summer evening, down by the lake at Mackinac Park. My name is Preston Davenport, by the way. I'm a fairly average guy with a regular office job in human resources. 
I've always loved the outdoors, though. Camping, hiking, that sort of thing. My friends and I often hang out together after work. Chase Michaels, Olivia Lassiter, and Wes Cobain. We all have our own hobbies and quirks, but it's the freaky stories and urban myths that we enjoy sharing the most. Anyway, that evening we were laughing at some jokes that Wes was cracking when Olivia pointed to those kids again. Hey, she said, do you guys see them too? They'd been there for quite a while now. I turned to look in their direction and noticed something utterly bizarre about them, which sent chills down my spine. Their eyes were pitch black, without any whites or irises. All of us exchanged nervous glances before deciding to cautiously approach them. As we got closer, my heart raced, and my hands felt clammy with fear. Still maintaining their distance but staring intently as if observing their prey, the black-eyed children unnervingly grinned back at us. They seemed ageless yet sinister in every possible way. We weren't sure what to think of this supernatural encounter until days later, when Chase stumbled upon some news articles detailing similar incidents around Mackinac Park Lake throughout the past years. Some involved missing persons or unexplained deaths. Every case defied explanation. Curiosity getting the best of us, we asked people who lived nearby if they knew anything about these strange kids with pitch black eyes. We eventually met an old lady named Martina Barnson, who had heard about the phenomenon since moving to the area back in the 1950s. According to her, they were believed to be malevolent entities that fed off people's fear. Martina told us about a man named Frederick Crenshaw who went missing in 1983 after allegedly encountering the black-eyed children. The mystery remained unsolved, as no trace of Frederick or his belongings was ever found. Then there was Pamela Forrester, brutally murdered near the lake in 1997. Witnesses claimed to have seen her talking to a group of black-eyed kids right before she vanished. With each chilling story we discovered, fear kept engulfing us until we couldn't take it any longer. We suddenly felt hunted and vulnerable, knowing that something sinister was lurking just beyond our line of sight. We no longer ventured near Mackinac Park Lake at night, and started avoiding any dark corners where these mysterious predators might be lurking. Even after all these years following our chilling encounter with these malevolent beings, my friends and I still can't shake off the fear that left us scarred for life. And though we might never truly understand the enigma surrounding those black-eyed children or learn their chilling motives, one thing is crystal clear. They strike when you least expect it mercilessly feeding on your raw, genuine fear for reasons beyond human comprehension. Years passed, and the once inseparable bond between Preston, Chase, Olivia, and Wes had begun to fade. Each one of them moved away to different cities and pursued their individual lives, trying their best to escape the haunting memories of that night at Mackinac Park Lake. However, despite their best efforts to move on, they often found themselves plagued by nightmares and inexplicable anxiety. These occurrences would inevitably bring them back together over late-night phone calls and occasional reunions as they searched for ways to deal with the phantom fear that never truly disappeared. Unexpectedly, during one of these reunions, their lives took another turn when they met a researcher named Dr. Laura Selby. For years, Dr. Selby had been investigating mysterious phenomena like the black-eyed children and had collected a wealth of information on such encounters from all over the world. Driven by their curiosity and longing for answers, the group shared their experience with Dr. Selby and decided to collaborate together in hopes of finally understanding the eerie nature of these entities. As their research progressed, they uncovered a complex web of connections that revealed a pattern in these sightings. Each encounter with the black-eyed children always took place when the victim was at their most vulnerable emotionally, 
often dealing with personal loss or crippling anxiety. This realization was both intriguing and terrifying since it revealed the full extent of these entities' abilities to sense and exploit human fears. Their investigation led them down a path that took them across continents as they delved deeper into ancient texts and oral traditions tying back to dark supernatural myths that echoed throughout various cultures. Countless stories about creatures thriving on primal fear. Ultimately, they learned that there was no known way to rid themselves entirely of these malevolent beings. The existence of black-eyed children dates back centuries already. However, they did discover something important. By facing their fears head-on instead of running from them, they could ensure that they never fell prey to these entities again. Though Preston, Chase, Olivia, and Wes's lives would never be quite the same as before the night at Mackinac Park Lake, their newfound knowledge strengthened them and gave them a purpose to educate others about these eerie entities and provide a sense of support for those who had encountered them. The group now continues their research, fully aware that they might never truly escape the black-eyed children but determined to face their fears unflinchingly and help others do the same. I still remember the day as if it were yesterday, October 12, 2006. I settled into my apartment after a long day of work, grabbed a cold beer, and switched on the TV for some relaxation. Well, the idea was to relax, but what happened later that night would change my life forever. My name is Randall Finnegan. I'm your average guy, 32 years old, single and working in a soul-crushing corporate job. My personal life was uneventful, that is, until three months ago, when that freaky night unfolded. By the time the police arrived, nothing could be done to save the victims or bring this nightmare to an end. It all began with a knock on my door around 10 p.m. while I was watching an action movie. Not expecting any visitors, I reluctantly got up to check who it was. As I opened the door, there stood two kids, probably no older than twelve, with a striking feature, emotionless black eyes. Hi, mister. Can we come inside? We're lost and scared, said the shorter one in a monotone voice. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. It wasn't normal for kids to wander around this late at night in our neighborhood. I don't think that's a good idea. I replied nervously, already feeling uneasy about these children. A strange sensation crept over me as they stared intently at me. Up until that point, things seemed relatively off but not dangerous. However, things took a dark turn when I heard screaming coming from across the street. I glanced away from the children for just a second, only to see my neighbor Jenna rushing out of her home with bloody claw marks all over her face. As she frantically stumbled across her lawn towards me, screaming for help, I grabbed her arm and pulled her inside, slamming the door shut behind us. With Jenna shaking and sobbing uncontrollably, she told me that two more kids, just like the ones on our porch, had barged into her home. She'd fought them off as they tried to tear her apart. I could hear the kids pounding against my front door, screaming in a terrifying chorus. Let us in! That's when I decided to call 911. The eerie note in their screams sent shivers down my spine. 911, what's your emergency? Terrified, I quickly described the situation and gave them my address. The operator's response still haunts me. We've been receiving multiple calls about incidents involving black-eyed children. A patrol car is en route. Keep your doors locked. The wait for the patrol car felt like an eternity. The room was filled with only Jenna's quiet sobs and our pounding hearts. When it finally showed up, 
We witnessed something that made my stomach churn. One of the officers was dragged into the darkness by those twisted kids before he could react. Finally, backup arrived. A heavily armed SWAT unit stormed out of their trucks to apprehend these demonic murderers. As I peered through my curtains while trembling with fear, I saw them making a break for it, escaping into the shadows with no trace. In the aftermath of this horrific incident, our neighborhood mourned the loss of innocent lives taken at the hands of these black-eyed children. Among murmurs at the local bar days later, someone mentioned an obscure online forum about similar encounters from around the world. An urban legend became a reality. As for who or what those kids were, we may never know. One thing's for sure. I'll never look at any kid with black eyes without experiencing that paralyzing terror ever again. I thought my life would eventually return to normal, but those terrifying events left me scarred and paranoid. Sleep became a luxury I could no longer afford, as the fear of those black-eyed children reappearing in the dead of night gripped me tightly. But I knew I had to keep going both out of respect for those who'd lost their lives and for my own sanity. Rebuilding my life became my priority, seeking therapy to help process the trauma, investing in an advanced security system, and even adopting a guard dog named Max to ensure that I would never again feel as vulnerable as I did on that nightmare-like evening three months ago. But it was the connection with Jenna whose life has been a mirror image of mine since that night, that helped us both heal together. Our shared trauma somehow transformed into a bond that gave us strength in our darkest moments, a testament to each other's resilience in the face of evil. As time passed and the frequency of terrifying stories involving black-eyed children on the internet slightly decreased, we continued our attempts to move forward. However, there was always this nagging feeling at the back of my mind that they were waiting, planning their next sinister move. Our lives may have been forever changed by that dreadful encounter, but Jenna and I have managed to carry on despite the unbearable weight it left on us both. We have found comfort in forging new bonds with others who share similar experiences realizing we're neither alone nor crazy in this fight against dark forces beyond human comprehension. And so, every day is a new battle with the shadows lurking behind every corner, but we refuse to let them extinguish our hope or ever again catch us unaware. It was just another ordinary evening when I found myself at the Northgate Shopping Center in northern Atlanta. The place was bustling, making me feel like I was in a typical American movie scene. Right then, standing beside the popcorn-smelling food court, I received a peculiar text message from my best friend Terrence. Hey man, there's something you need to see. Meet me near the fountain ASAP. The tone was unusual for him. Terence usually enjoys cracking jokes. I could sense the urgency, so I quickly made my way through the crowds towards the centerpiece fountain. The water gurgled and spilled over with a calming effect as I waited for Terence to show up. Before moving further, it's worth mentioning that my name is Eamon O'Reilly, and Terence and I have been inseparable for years. We both work in cybersecurity, so we're quite familiar with unraveling strange occurrences and solving complex problems. Today would prove just how crucial this seemingly innocuous introduction really was. As soon as Terence arrived, without delay or a hint of his usual dry humor, he handed me his phone, where a Reddit post displayed multiple accounts of alleged sightings of black-eyed children lurking around Northgate Shopping Center over the past two weeks. Initially skeptical yet intrigued by these eerie claims, we decided to dig deeper. While investigating all available shopping center cameras and Wi-Fi activity archives at home, 
which we had access to due to our expertise, we discovered two online users communicating frequently about their lethal intentions. A closer examination of their messages unveiled an uncanny resemblance to the modus operandi mentioned in the Reddit encounters. As days passed, our sense of unease grew like weeds after rainfall while simultaneously tracing people using the handles, Carrion Kid, and Nemesis Crux. We managed to confirm our suspicions when we came across a picture posted by Carrion Kid, a dark silhouette, beady eyes with no white, and a sinister grin. The image was bone chilling. On the following Saturday evening, after much persuasion, we decided to apprehend these menacing kids. A message intercepted by us told us the next dark act would occur in a secluded corner of the shopping center's parking lot. Once there, we caught sight of two sinister silhouettes approaching an oblivious couple, who unwittingly became part of this twisted tale. In that split second, our cybersecurity skills became redundant, as whatever we knew would prove useless in dealing with what was looming in front of us. Terror rose like bile in our throats as we intervened just in time, before a razor-sharp blade reached its intended victim. After a brief scuffle and screaming from all parties involved, Terence and I somehow managed to grab hold of the young monsters with black tattooed on eyes amid the salty stench of blood and tobacco. Once handcuffed and interrogated by police back at the station, the crazed miners stubbornly refused to share their real motives. They only chuckled in a disconcerting manner that haunted me for hours afterward. Later that night, Word got around that, Carrion Kid, was actually named Timothy Jorgensen and Nemesis Crux, was Keith Duarte, both runaways with recent histories of violence and delinquency whose actions were fueled by some unknown motive. Finally freed from their monstrous grip yet still shaken at the core, Terence and I returned to our normal routine. Our once great fear subsided but never vanished fully. There will always be unanswered questions lurking beneath the surface like hungry sharks ready for their next meal. Months had passed since the harrowing encounter with Timothy and Keith. Though life had seemingly reverted back to normal, a lingering uneasiness continued to shroud Terence and me. The chilling laughter of the black-eyed, tattooed boys rang like an ominous echo at the back of our minds. Our once impregnable bond, fortified by solving cybersecurity puzzles together, had now been tainted by the macabre experience we shared. Shopping centers lost their appeal as joyous places and were replaced with foreboding and the fear of encountering more threats lurking in the shadows. Work became even more engrossing as we lost ourselves in code, hacking, and unraveling digital mysteries, anything to distract us from those terrible memories. It was during one particularly late night at work that we stumbled upon another eerie pattern emerging online. A hacker group had emerged, idolizing Timothy and Keith as vigilantes against societal norms. They referred to themselves as the children of Nemesis, spreading terror and mayhem through dark web channels and hacking major companies. Terence and I realized that while our physical confrontation with the ominous duo was over, our fight against their horrific legacy was only just beginning. Facing a new form of evil that spread like a malicious virus through the very digital realm we had devoted our lives to protecting, we resolved to hunt down this malevolent hacker group and end their sadistic game once and for all. Little did we know that unmasking, the children of Nemesis, would thrust us deeper into a dangerous world far beyond anything we had ever experienced before. I was working the late shift at a 24-hour diner in a popular part of New York City when it happened. It was a slow night with just a few regulars nursing their coffees and chatting amongst themselves. 
My shift was crawling by, and I couldn't wait to get home and collapse into bed. Little did I know that my night was about to take a horrifying turn. My name is Everett Donoghue, by the way, but everyone just calls me Ev. I grew up in Queens and eventually found work as a short-order cook in Manhattan. There's nothing particularly special about me, just your average working-class stiff trying to make ends meet. I stepped out back from my break, lit up a cigarette, and leaned against the grimy alley wall. That's when I first noticed her, a young girl with raven black hair and an eerie stillness about her. She stood at the mouth of the alleyway gazing in my direction with eyes that sent a shiver down my spine. Something about her didn't seem right. Feeling uneasy, I quickly stamped out my cigarette and retreated inside to resume my duties. The girl loomed large in my thoughts as I cracked eggs and grilled burgers throughout the evening. When my co-worker Eddie arrived to relieve me, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. It wasn't until later that I discovered Eddie had found something unusual outside the diner, an intricately carved pocket knife resting on the doorstep where the girl had been standing earlier. The following nights were more of the same, slow hours at work interrupted occasionally by sightings of the mysterious dark-haired girl peering at me from across the street. At first, she'd linger just long enough for me to confirm my suspicions before disappearing into the shadows again. Then she began following me home. Feeling violated and deeply frightened, I confided in my neighbor Samira about my unsettling predicament. As an off-duty cop, she had a keen sense of danger and suggested I file a formal report with the NYPD. The thought of involving the police hadn't crossed my mind, but her logical reasoning quickly convinced me. The police were skeptical at first, responding to my concerns with polite but dismissive nods. Frustrated, I implored them to interview other residents of my building who had reported similarly eerie encounters with the girl. Their stories were strikingly similar, the quiet menace surrounding the girl the purposeful gaps in her all-black attire, and unusual items left behind like the pocket knife. The interviews finally garnered some attention, and a detective named Metzger was assigned to look into the case. As Metzger delved deeper into the investigation, a sinister picture emerged of a group of children known as the Black-Eyed Kids, responsible for several brutal attacks around New York City. Apparently, they targeted vulnerable people after hours using fear and intimidation tactics before assaulting and robbing their victims. The police were hesitant to connect my ordeal with this vicious gang due to some inconclusive evidence. Tensions escalated and finally culminated in a violent encounter in the diner's parking lot when three of these black-eyed kids, including that same dark-haired girl, attacked me without warning. I fought desperately for my life with every ounce of strength I had left. When another car pulled up and startled them with its headlights, they retreated into the shadows, leaving me battered, bloodied, and gasping for air. Officer Samira accompanied me to the hospital, where concerned doctors treated my wounds and gently urged me to cooperate more fully with Detective Metzger's inquiries. We gradually untangled a web of dark motives involving these children, abused backgrounds leading to lives filled with violence and despair on the city's outskirts. It took several more weeks for investigators to uncover some semblance of an origin story for the black-eyed kids, but the details remain maddeningly elusive. The children seemed to spring from some unknown source of malevolence that honed their predatory instincts and drove them towards these heinous acts. My life eventually returned to some semblance of normalcy, although I'll never forget the harrowing experience of being stalked by the black-eyed kids. The truth behind their dark origins remained shrouded in mystery, leaving me to wonder if those terrifying nights were just the beginning of something even more sinister. Months had passed since my encounter with the black-eyed kids, 
and I was beginning to find a sense of stability in my life again. The diner became less foreboding, the city streets no longer filled me with dread, and my sleepless nights slowly gave way to more peaceful slumbers. However, I couldn't shake the unrelenting unease that plagued me, as I knew those cold-hearted children were still roaming the city's dark corners, waiting for their next unsuspecting victim. One evening, Detective Metzger contacted me out of the blue with a possible lead on this twisted group. He'd received an anonymous tip about a building on the outskirts of the city, an old, abandoned warehouse where the black-eyed kids supposedly gathered. Though it seemed like an inconclusive lead at best, there was something about the desperation in Metzger's voice that compelled me to join his clandestine investigation into the warehouse. Gripped by fear but equally driven by a desperate need for closure, I followed him into this unhallowed sanctum of darkness and despair. What we uncovered that night in that decrepit building would shake both of us to our core and change our lives forever. I still remember the day it all happened so vividly. It was Monday, October 16th, a cool evening in a small town called Oak Ridge, nestled in the picturesque mountains of Wyoming. After a long day of classes at the university, I decided to treat myself to some mouth-watering pizza at Timo's, my go-to place for comfort food. As I walked through the door, a familiar aroma of baked dough and melted cheese welcomed me. I grabbed a slice and sat next to my childhood friend, Jasper Simmons. We caught up and talked about our lives as college students. Everything seemed so simple then. Afterwards, we went for a walk around town for old times' sake. We strolled past well-known spots in our quiet community, Trayvon's Cafe, The Old Mill, and eventually onto Mill Street Bridge, a favorite hangout for people who wanted to enjoy scenic views over the river. About halfway across the Mill Street Bridge, that's when it happened. At first, it just seemed like a couple of kids were playing around near the edge of the water. What caught our attention was their odd appearance, those pitch black eyes, as if they had no soul. One kid was called Adamo, his sister's name was Nyla. No one quite knew where they had come from. They just appeared one day and took up residence in an abandoned house nearby. We hardly had time to process their unsettling presence before things escalated beyond our wildest imaginations. Those ordinary-looking kids suddenly sprang into action with an unnatural agility that seemed impossible for their small frames. First, they lunged at an older gentleman fishing by the riverbank. Before anyone could intervene, they attacked him with such force that he collapsed onto the ground, screaming in agony as blood oozed from his wounds. Swiftly moving like shadows from one victim to another, Adamo and Nyla continued their horrific rampage along the riverbank. The growing panic amongst the gathered crowd was palpable and everyone scrambled for safety. Jasper and I retreated to his car, shaken by what we'd just witnessed. We tried to call the police, but our shaking hands made it difficult to dial. While we waited for help to arrive, Adamo and Nyla continued terrorizing unsuspecting passers-by, leaving behind a trail of broken bodies and distraught survivors in their wake. After what felt like a lifetime, Sirens wailed in the distance, forcing the two siblings to disappear into the shadows. A massive manhunt began, and the town turned upside down, but nobody ever found them. In the days following this nightmare, whispers spread that Adamo and Nyla had been part of a covert government experiment gone wrong, a lethal combination of supernatural abilities mixed with uncontrollable bloodlust. Today, as I share my haunting experience with you, Oak Ridge still hasn't recovered from the fear-filled night when Ademo and Nyla brought terror upon us all. 
So if you find yourself wandering down Mill Street Bridge, tread carefully, for those dark-eyed siblings are still out there, somewhere. Years have passed since that fateful night, but the memory remains etched in our minds as if it were just yesterday. Even as time marches on, the atmosphere in Oak Ridge is forever changed, stricken by a pervasive undercurrent of unease. Parents have become overly protective, keeping a watchful eye on their children as they play in the streets. Late night strolls are now a thing of the past. People stay indoors once the sun sets, unwilling to risk encountering those soulless black eyes lurking in the shadows. Despite numerous investigations and wild speculations about what happened to Ademo and Nyla, no one has ever uncovered any clues to their whereabouts. Some believe they've sought refuge in a remote hiding place, far from the reaches of civilization. Others suspect a clandestine government agency whisked them away under cover of darkness, desperate to contain their dangerous secrets. Theories abound, each more bizarre than the last. However, the mystery continues to evade resolution. As I've grown up and moved away from that small town for my studies and career, memories of that night have faded into vague recollections like the fleeting whispers of a half-forgotten dream. Occasional reunions with Jasper bring us back to that fateful evening when our innocence was stripped away by terror but we find ourselves unable to dwell on it for too long before needing to distance ourselves again. Yet somehow this grim specter has followed me far beyond Oak Ridge's borders, the haunting realization that even in seemingly ordinary lives, unimaginable darkness can lurk just beneath the surface. What frightens me most, though, is not knowing whether those sinister siblings will continue their bloody spree elsewhere or simply lay in wait for an opportune moment when they can once again strike terror into unsuspecting hearts. Until then, let this chilling tale serve as a grim reminder. Always remain vigilant and hold your loved ones close because you never know when your world might be turned upside down. It all began at one of those office parties you see in movies. I never thought it would happen to me, but it did. Everything seemed perfectly normal, and then it happened. My name is Emmett Sullivan, and I used to work for a small marketing firm in Denver. The night this story took place, December 16th, our company rented out a popular event hall downtown for our holiday bash. I never liked big gatherings, especially with coworkers I barely interacted with, but sometimes you've got to bite the bullet to keep your job. As the party went on, things started to feel a bit weird. You know that feeling when something isn't quite right but you can't exactly put your finger on it? Yeah, that's what I felt. I brushed it off as the usual social anxiety I experience at such events. I stepped out onto the balcony for a cigarette and spotted two kids across the street staring at me. Something about them was definitely off. It wasn't their attire or their posture. They had pitch black eyes that seemed to pierce through my soul. Feeling uneasy, I went back inside and found my buddy Zachary, Ziggy, Kingstone, everyone called him Ziggy, drowning himself in another whiskey sour at the bar. Ziggy, have you seen those kids across the street? I asked hesitantly. He turned around and squinted through the glass window. What kids? When I looked again, they were gone. That creepy sensation overwhelmed me. Telling myself it was just my imagination, I tried to focus on getting through this godforsaken party. The night went downhill from there. People started arguing over nonsense, spilled drinks and stepped on toes turned into vicious verbal exchanges with slanderous accusations thrown around like confetti. Tension built steadily in every corner of the room. That's when one of our coworkers collapsed out of the blue. 
We rushed over as he began convulsing violently on the floor. Someone called 911, but there was nothing we could do. All our frantic efforts to keep him alive were useless. He was a healthy and robust guy with no history of heart problems or seizures. I glanced outside and noticed those kids with the black eyes were back, watching from the street. What followed can only be described as pure chaos. People's inhibitions seemed to evaporate entirely. They screamed obscenities at each other, hurled broken glass, and used lethal force without a second thought. The violence was escalating, and it didn't seem like there was an end in sight. As the situation became increasingly dire, Ziggy and I managed to find a backdoor amid the pandemonium. We sprinted towards my car a block away, passing by the black-eyed kids now grinning maliciously in our direction. Something about their presence felt intrinsically evil and sent chills down my spine. We survived that night, but others weren't so lucky. Two more co-workers passed away in the aftermath due to their injuries. After digging through online forums and spending countless hours researching these mysterious black-eyed children, I eventually connected with a woman living in a nearby town who had also experienced a similar ordeal. According to her story, the kids called themselves Cain and Lilith, though God only knows where those names came from or what power those children held. Their presence triggers chaos fueled by human vulnerability, a dark force consuming all who cross their path. I still don't know how or why these events occur. All I know is that since encountering those children, life has never been the same for me or Ziggy, like surviving a storm that permanently altered everything we once considered normal. Ziggy and I eventually stopped working at the marketing firm, unable to focus or function normally with the memories of that horrifying night haunting us. We resolved to understand more about these black-eyed kids, Kane and Lilith believing they might show up again. Our research led us down a rabbit hole of mysticism, paranormal occurrences, and supernatural theories not often discussed in the mainstream. We spent countless hours interviewing witnesses who had similar encounters and studying historical phenomena that seemed to revolve around these enigmatic children. Some people thought of them as agents of ultimate chaos with ancient origins while others described them as malevolent entities feeding on human misery. Regardless, everyone agreed their presence was undeniably nefarious. Our quest for understanding turned into an obsession. Sleepless nights and drained bank accounts became our new reality, as we traveled across the country seeking answers from anyone who'd experienced similar incidents. In time, we formed a small group of like-minded survivors who were also determined to unravel the mysteries surrounding Cain and Lilith. As trust grew among us, so did a sense of purpose, despite swimming in an ocean of uncertainty and fear. Yet even with this newfound support system in place, an ever-present dread burrowed deep within our psyche. It was clear that normalcy was gone forever as we realized there was no turning back from the path we'd set ourselves upon. Strengthened by our bond but forever looking over our shoulders, Ziggy and I continued our nerve-wracking journey into the unknown world of darkness that had chosen us as its unwilling participants. I never thought I'd be sitting here, sharing this story with the world. But it's something I need to get off my chest. My life changed that one fateful night at that popular spot, the pier, in Los Angeles. It was August 12, 2015, and the unusual quietness that evening still sends chills down my spine. My name is Leor Huxley, and at the time, I was working as an account manager for a well-known pharmaceutical company. My job required me to travel constantly. 
I felt like I had made a wrong turn in life. My marriage was crumbling, and work demanded so much of my time. Delayed flights and missed meetings had become routine. I had just landed in L.A. for an important conference when I received a call from an old college friend, Rajiv Kapoor. We hadn't spoken in years. Even hearing his voice brought back memories of our hectic football games and wild nights out fraternizing with girls. It seemed like a lifetime ago. He suggested grabbing some dinner that night at Presto, a restaurant he often frequented near the pier. Little did I know that this decision would lead to a horrific chain of events. As we strolled along the illuminated boardwalk after dinner, indulging in nostalgic banter on our college days and how life took us down different paths, we noticed something odd, unnervingly quiet for a warm summer's evening. Ever wonder what happened to Elise Weber? Rajiv asked suddenly, his grin fading away. What made you think of her? The mention of her name made me uneasy and reluctant to rehash the past. Rajiv shrugged nonchalantly. Just hit me out of nowhere. Suddenly, we heard what sounded like sinister laughter echoing throughout the empty pier. Searching for its source, we noticed three strange-looking children with unsettling gazes and eerily black eyes, Amelia, Odeli, and Elijah. As their laughter grew louder, the air became frigid. Overwhelmed with inexplicable dread, I voiced my concerns to Rajiv, who shared my anxiety but shrugged it off. Let's just head back, man, he whispered. And so we did. As the days passed, an ominous feeling lingered just below the surface of our exhaustion. We couldn't ignore whispers of bizarre accounts involving the peculiar children. Rumors circulated that each victim they engaged with was found viciously murdered or sadistically tormented both mentally and physically. During a coffee break at the conference, Cameron Novak, a charismatic and extroverted peer from our company, recounted a disturbing tale he had heard about some local kids gruesomely dismembering a homeless man near the pier. Unable to shake these thoughts from my mind, I confided in Rajiv about how we may have been inches from sharing the grisly fate of others who encountered Amelia, Odeli, and Elijah. Their laughter haunted my nightmares and grew clearer as we pieced together stories of their malevolent deeds. The evening before our departure back home, Rajiv received a distressing call from one of his colleagues in his hotel room. Their voices quivered in terror as they recounted finding Cameron's door ajar and his room filled with bloody entrails and desperate scrawlings on the walls. As soon as he hung up the phone, we immediately booked a flight back home. We never spoke of that night again, avoiding each other's eyes at work while battling our personal demons. Weeks after the incident, Rajiv stumbled upon an old newspaper article detailing how three young siblings named Amelia, Odeli, and Elijah disappeared near the pier decades ago. Their bodies were never found despite exhaustive searches, and stories of their vicious exploits have been whispered among families living nearby ever since. Some claim the siblings rematerialized as the black-eyed children to enact their chilling revenge on those unlucky enough to cross their path. Shaken by the gruesome revelations, I couldn't help but feel a heavy weight of guilt knowing that we narrowly escaped the clutches of the sinister siblings. Life continued, but it was impossible for me to ignore the darkness that lingered in my mind. I found myself revisiting the peer incident time and time again, unable to find closure or make sense of it all. Every creak and whisper around me seemed to echo the laughter of Amelia, Odeli, and Elijah. Desperate for answers, I decided to delve into LA's underbelly and search for any information that could lead me to an understanding of who these children were and what drove their insatiable thirst for torment and death. My investigation unearthed tales passed down through generations about a cruel family who resided near the pier long ago. According to legend, 
the parents, tyrannical and unsympathetic, nurtured an environment rife with abuse and suffering. Amelia, Odeli, and Elijah were raised in depravity as their warped minds took shape. It was believed that a malevolent force, perhaps born from their pain or summoned through ancestral misdeeds, was drawn to the children, using them as vessels to unleash chaos on humanity. As the years went by without any signs of retribution or solace, Rajiv eventually succumbed to his inability to cope with the traumatic memories. He left our company to start anew in a remote town, well away from any painful reminders of what had unfolded on that fateful night at the pier. For both Rajiv and me, life would never be the same, but in my relentless pursuit for answers, I had somehow given myself a sense of purpose, my calling intertwined with the mysterious darkness we had encountered. My journey eventually led me to form a small group of individuals who had similar experiences with malevolent forces or paranormal phenomena plaguing their lives. Together, we vowed to use our shared knowledge and resources to not only confront these dark entities but also bring solace to those afflicted by them. No longer burdened by a sense of solitude and despair, I had found new meaning in life, finally able to channel my past trauma into something greater than myself. While it was clear that we couldn't undo the horrors of the past, we could use our combined strength and resolve to push back against the shadows lurking just beneath the surface and, perhaps one day, break free from their grasp. It was an unusually quiet night at O'Malley's Pub, nestled in one of the busiest neighborhoods in Boston. The dimly lit place was so packed that you could hardly move without rubbing shoulders with the person next to you. But that never bothered me. It had been my favorite hangout spot for years, a place where I could unwind and shake off the weariness of everyday life. I was Jackson Mathers, a 36-year-old software engineer, seeking solace in my whiskey. Yeah, remember when Jackson accidentally sent everyone that rogue email during his first week? Teased Jeremy, my longtime co-worker and friend, as he stirred his beer with a mischievous grin. Others around us erupted into laughter while I chuckled along, shaking my head at the embarrassing memory. It was barely past midnight when more people began filing into the pub. Among them were teenagers sporting an unsettling appearance, inky black eyes and unnervingly wide smiles. They weaved through the crowd like they owned the place, their synchronized movements catching everyone's attention. Their ringleader approached me first. Hey, nice to meet you, he said unapologetically while extending his hand. I'm Nathan Blackwood. I paused, trying to make sense of their sudden arrival, and recovered enough to shake his hand reluctantly. Despite our initial suspicion, we fell into easy conversation with Nathan and his friends as if their mysterious arrival were inconsequential. Strangely enough, every time one of them spoke or moved, they did it with robotic precision, appearing almost choreographed. As hours rolled by and drinks continued to flow, we noticed the chaos unfolding around us. Fights erupted across the room. People started vomiting. Others passed out en masse on the floor. That's when I realized that every time Nathan or any of his friends interacted with other patrons, something sinister followed. Their black-eyed presence spreads malaise like ink in water. Fighting against the disorientation, I whispered to Jeremy. We need to get out of here. Together, we dodged through the disarray until we reached the exit, stepping out of the stifling atmosphere into the cold night air. With ragged breaths and shaking limbs, we tried to make sense of what had just happened inside. Over the next several days, 
We couldn't shake off the dark memory of that night as news reports trickled in about mysterious deaths and strange illnesses plaguing those who frequented O'Malley's pub. As our lives were thrown into surreal chaos, we sought answers. Digging into public records and conducting late-night Google searches eventually led us to local urban legends and whispers about Nathan Blackwood, an enigmatic figure with a murky past shrouded in bizarre incidents. Torn between fear and desperation, Jeremy confronted a grizzled old man at a bar in South Boston who claimed to be a relative of one of Nathan's victims. His eyes hollowed by sorrow and rage, he told us that Nathan was nothing like anything we'd ever encountered. He's evil, he spat on the floor, manifesting through their pitch black eyes, possessing any soul they come in contact with. The revelation dawned upon us. We had unwittingly mingled with sinister beings wearing human masks and left traces of their dark presence on everyone they came in contact with, infecting so many lives with just a touch or a word. And although O'Malley's pub would never be the same again, neither would we be, having come face to face with an unimaginable horror lurking within the shadows of humanity itself. Haunted by our encounter with Nathan Blackwood and his sinister friends, Jeremy and I grew distant from our usual circles. Fearful that their darkness may have tainted us as well, we couldn't bear to put our loved ones at risk. Instead, we dedicated ourselves to finding a way to protect others from falling victim to the black-eyed menace. Our mutual obsession led us down a rabbit hole of research into ancient folklore, paranormal phenomena, and obscure rituals that might hold the key to combating this unknown evil. Experimenting with various protective charms and rituals, we hoped to find something that would shield us from these sinister beings and allow us to warn others of their existence. Through trial and error, we discovered an ancient symbol, a sigil imbued with the power to ward off dark entities. With newfound hope, we adorned our homes, our clothes, and even tattooed it upon our skin, convinced that it was the key to protecting those around us. Fate had other plans, though. As if sensing our attempts to stand against them, they returned more formidable than ever, this time infiltrating not just O'Malley's pub but other establishments throughout the city of Boston. Fearful whispers spread like wildfire among the population as reports of destructive encounters with black-eyed people continued to increase. Yet despite their growing influence and power, Nathan and his followers seemed fixated on Jeremy and me determined to break the protection we had found and exact their revenge on us for daring to fight back against them. With each passing day, the lines between friend and foe blurred, sleepless nights were haunted by chilling nightmares, while paranoia gripped every waking moment. Knowing that there was no turning back now, we steeled ourselves for the inevitable confrontation ahead one that would determine the very fate of our souls and perhaps change everything we thought we knew about the world around us. As all-consuming darkness threatened to engulf Boston and its unknowing inhabitants, Jeremy and I agreed that we would face this insidious threat head-on, united in our resolve and driven by our shared experiences that fateful night at O'Malley's pub. So there I was, sitting in Danny's Diner, located on the outskirts of a small, tight-knit town in Colorado. The place thrived in spite of the huge retail giant that had opened shopping centers a few miles away. Though it was well past midnight, the diner was still filled with people catching up on old times. I took a sip of my coffee and glanced at the clock. It's really time for me to go. I thought as I emptied my wallet to pay for my meal. I knew that working late would have consequences, but passing up the opportunity to meet with an old friend visiting from out of town was too good to resist. Terence Miller, am I right? 
It's been ages. The sudden call pulled me away from my thoughts. I looked up and realized that an old acquaintance, Sylvia Finch, had recognized me. We'd gone to high school together and hadn't seen each other since graduation. We exchanged some pleasantries, and she eventually invited me to join her group of friends at their table. There were four of them, Sylvia, Andy, Chelsea, and Logan. The conversation flowed effortlessly with laughter filling the air. All seemed well until Chelsea suddenly brought up something unsettling. I heard there's been a string of strange deaths around this area lately, she said nervously. My curiosity peaked, knowing that this could be relatable to the victims or families associated with these crimes as part of my work. Andy appeared concerned as well but chimed in nonetheless. Yeah, people are saying they've seen groups of kids with black eyes lurking around the crime scenes. The whole table fell silent for a moment before Logan offered his input on the matter, shaking hands and holding his beer tightly. I don't believe in supernatural stuff, he scoffed. Someone must be trying to pull off some elaborate prank. After finishing our drinks and saying our goodbyes, I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that spread through me. I got in my car and began to drive home through the near-empty streets when I spotted a bizarre figure in my rearview mirror. As I squinted to get a better look, I noticed it was a young girl with black eyes, no older than 14 or 15, standing by the edge of the road. Shocked and unable to move, I watched as she vanished into thin air. My heart raced as I finally snapped out of it and floored the accelerator. Upon returning home, I scrambled for information on these mysterious, black-eyed kids and how they might be connected to the recent deaths. Over the course of several days, my digging led me to uncover a pattern in the incidents that aligned with numerous accounts describing victims opening their doors to these kids before succumbing to terrible fates. It wasn't until I interviewed witnesses from three separate crime scenes who described that their friends had received calls from unknown numbers before encountering these kids. Tracing back these calls led me to a name, Sebastian Aldrich. But who was Sebastian? The answer revealed itself when authorities found his lifeless body with a phone in hand on the outskirts of town. The group of black-eyed kids had struck again claiming another victim. Locals speculated that this was vengeance for some wrongdoing Sebastian had done. But even after digging deeper into Sebastian's background or retracing his steps days before his death, their motives remained shrouded in mystery. Though rumors never ceased and people still whispered about those ominous kids with black eyes, no concrete explanations or motives ever surfaced. And despite our best efforts to make sense of it all, the terrifying fear those evil figures left behind would follow us for years to come. As time passed, life in the small town gradually returned to normal, albeit with an undercurrent of unease. People locked their doors more frequently and were reluctant to answer unexpected knocks. Theories about the malevolent black-eyed kids spread through the town like wildfire. Some believed they were spirits of restless children seeking justice, while others dismissed them as mere hallucinations. To keep the peace, local law enforcement increased patrols on deserted roads and neighborhoods and monitored any suspicious activities related to these eerie beings. However, as months turned into years without any new sightings or incidents, the people of the town slowly let their guard down. The stories of the black-eyed kids faded into legend, and whispered tales were shared around campfires and sleepovers. Yet for those who had witnessed firsthand the horrors tied to these supernatural bringers of misfortune, sleep did not come so easily. The images of their faces and their unending black stare left an indelible mark on us that would never fade away entirely. We remained cautious and vigilant for those fleeting glimpses of danger lurking in the shadows at night. 
In a strange twist of fate, I eventually forged a friendship with Sylvia, Andy, Chelsea, and Logan. Our bond was forged by compelling conversations and shared memories until late at night in Danny's diner, which could keep the nightmares at bay for just a little longer. Together, we found solace in each other's company, buoyed by strength, and wrestled from whatever darkness may visit our town again. The chilling experience left me more attentive to my work as well. I tirelessly pursued every lead that hinted at even the slightest connection to those black-eyed kids to ensure our town's fragile peace would last. Though we hadn't fully solved this sinister mystery that haunted us all, we remained steadfast in our determination to keep our community safe from whatever otherworldly threats may still dwell amidst its serenity. The air was unusually still as I walked down Main Street, a popular gathering spot in my town. It hooked me from the moment I moved here. Something about the mix of local businesses and friendly faces made it irresistible. I usually love the buzz of people enjoying their Saturday evening, but this time, something felt off. My name is Randall Morrison. I moved here about a year ago after getting a job at a nearby tech company. On the surface, I'm your typical guy in his late twenties, single, renting an apartment, and working far too many hours for far too little pay. But more importantly for this story, I've always been drawn to true crime and horror stories. That eerie feeling persisted as I walked to my favorite bar, Daly's Tavern. It was packed per usual, but as I took a seat at the booth in the corner, one group seemed to stand out, three kids with jet black eyes huddled together near the entrance. Curiosity peaked, and I couldn't help but pay closer attention to them. As the evening wore on and more people poured into dailies, it felt like everyone knew these kids except me. They would casually whisper to people, who would laugh along with them like old friends. Yet there was something sinister lurking beneath their smiles. Even their laughter seemed tainted. At one point, I noticed Peter Kelly, a town council member, talking to those black-eyed kids while having a drink at the bar counter. We met briefly at some fundraiser previously held in town and struck up a casual friendship since then. When Peter caught my eye, he waved me over. Hey, Randall. He greeted me warmly as I approached him cautiously. Hey, Peter. I replied hesitantly. My eyes flicked to the kids standing next to him. Who are these guys? They're everywhere tonight. Peter scratched his head and shot an uneasy glance at the black-eyed kids. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure. I figured they were friends of someone in town. As we kept talking, one of the kids reached inside their backpack and pulled out a knife that glistened under the dim bar light. With horror mounting in my chest, I realized what was about to happen. The kid casually turned towards Peter and began aggressively slashing his throat. The room exploded into chaos. People stampeded over one another to exit. My ears were filled with screams, glasses shattering, and frantic footsteps on the wooden floor. I managed to dodge my way out of the bar, making eye contact with those black-eyed kids one last time before running out the door. I spent days hiding after that incident, trying to piece together who these kids were and what their motives might have been. Upon news of further brutal attacks involving the same group, it became apparent that this once peaceful town had become vulnerable prey in their murderous game. Months passed until a private investigator shared grim findings. These kids were orphans adopted by a mysterious organization that brainwashed them into cold-hearted killers, eliminating anyone deemed a threat. The investigator couldn't further dig but advised me never to speak of it again. Even today, 
as I attempt to find solace and closure in recounting this nightmare chapter of my life. The identity of those kids remains unknown to me, leaving behind their chilling legacy as faceless antagonists and a trail of blood-stained memories. In the years following that tragic event, I found it increasingly difficult to shake off the trauma. Though I tried my best to continue living a normal life, the memories of the brutal murders and those black-eyed kids would constantly resurface, haunting my dreams. The once vibrant and welcoming streets of our town were now tainted by fear, suspicion, and a dark cloud that seemed to hang permanently over our community. People began furtively locking their doors at night and casting wary glances at strangers out of lingering unease. Bonds between neighbors weakened as trust was shattered, and we all became reluctant to talk about what happened. I knew I needed some form of closure, and so I began seeking answers on my own, delving into true crime forums, deep web exploration, obscure libraries, and other sources in an attempt to uncover the horrifying truth about that mysterious organization. On more than one occasion, I received anonymous threats advising me to halt my investigations or suffer dire consequences. Yet, my drive for justice grew stronger each time I hit a dead end. Throughout this personal journey into horror's deepest abysses, not only did I uncover chilling secrets about other similar cases worldwide, but I also discovered countless victims living in the shadows, many burdened with symptoms eerily similar to my own. Paranoid thoughts persisted. Were they still watching? As the years went by, I clung to my relentless pursuit of truth, desperate to find some sort of solace among these dark mysteries. Until one day, in an almost poetic act of divine intervention, new evidence emerged that exposed the enigmatic organization behind these horrifying events. With its collapse came relief and hope for survivors. Those scars would remain forever etched into our souls. The nightmare was finally over. Or so it seemed. My name is Randall Morrison and I survived an encounter with those sinister black-eyed children who left unfathomable destruction in their wake. And in sharing my story here today, I hope that others can find solace in knowing they are not alone. Despite the darkness that forever lingers in our lives, we must refuse to let our tormentors define who we become. Human resilience is a power beyond the grasp of evil, and together, We'll fight back until every last shadow is driven away. I still remember that fateful night. It was a Tuesday, August 7th to be exact. A buddy of mine, Nathan Crowley, and I were hanging out in one of those popular bars in downtown Austin. It wasn't our usual spot. We were just looking to try something new. I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Tyler Reed, a freelance photographer living here in Austin. But back then, things were different. My buddy Nathan, a software engineer, always had my back through thick and thin. We didn't really understand what was happening at the moment. The bar was bustling with people talking, laughing, and having a good time when suddenly it went silent. It seemed like everyone could feel the eerie atmosphere that crept through the room as a group of kids walked in. These weren't regular kids, though. Their eyes were solid black. Three of them, all eerily similar looking with pale skin and an uncanny calmness about them casually strolled into the bar, as if they owned the place. Whispers and uneasy glances spread among the bar patrons as everyone stared at these strange kids with their unsettling gaze. Nathan told me to ignore them and do our own thing. We were never people to dabble in others' business. We preferred to stick to ourselves. Throughout the night, our conversations took us down memory lane reminiscing about our wild college years when, 
Mid-sentence, Nathan froze. Suddenly he said, Tyler, check this out. That kid just bit right into that guy's arm. I turned around to see one of the black-eyed kids sinking their teeth into someone's flesh. Panic set in as people rushed towards the doors to escape these strange children, who began attacking others in ways that would give anyone nightmares for years. Nathan and I tried to fight them off while protecting those around us who couldn't fend for themselves. But the chaos blinded us. We ended up running from the bar and into the streets, managing to lose sight of our attackers. We gasped for breath and shouted at each other questions, like how these things could have happened or what those inexplicable creatures could be. Nathan showed me a horrible bite wound on his arm that I hadn't noticed before. It wasn't pretty. A few days later, we were in Nathan's apartment, discussing the nightmarish events over and over again. We realized that after the attack, no one else seemed to have any recollection of what happened, as if it were wiped from their memories. My curiosity got the better of me, so I decided to dig deeper. Digging through databases and reaching out to local contacts led me to a man named Elliot Bridges, an expert in strange and horrifying creatures, including black-eyed children. He said he had dealt with these kinds of entities before. Elliot explained that these terrifying creatures feed on fear and pain. He told stories about their shocking origin, a tale even government officials wouldn't dare repeat. Their grasp on reality dangled on a thread. But as for their names and complete stories? That remains a mystery, even for experts like Elliot. Days turned into weeks, and weeks into months. Nathan's wound healed, but scars remained forever engraved on our minds. The night our nightmares became all too real. Fear and paranoia kept creeping into our daily lives, even as time passed. That terrible night couldn't be erased from our memories, no matter how much we tried. It's as if the encounter with the black-eyed children was an indelible mark in our souls, a black ink that stained our existence. As we slowly attempted to rebuild whatever semblance of normalcy we had left, Nathan noticed that dreadful events began happening around us. People we knew started to experience misfortune, accidents, sudden illnesses, and unexplained incidents of violence all seemed to originate from anyone who had been inside the bar that night. It didn't take long for us to realize the apparent connection. As soon as the pieces started falling into place, we decided that we couldn't let this curse plague us or anyone else any longer. We sought out Elliot Bridges once again, asking him for help in finding a way to rid ourselves and our community of this affliction. He hesitated at first but eventually agreed to guide us through an ancient ritual purported to purge the evil influence of these creatures. Under his supervision, Nathan and I embarked on an arduous journey into the darkest corners of arcane knowledge. Gathering ingredients under moonlit skies and learning cryptic incantations became a strange new routine for us. Each step hummed with danger but also with hope, hope that perhaps we could find a way for those memories to stop haunting us more than just figuratively. As our obsession with breaking free from the grasp of the black-eyed children grew stronger, so did our friendship with Elliot. Amidst terrifying tales and eerie silences shared over candlelight, bonds were forged that went beyond words. As shadows seemed to lengthen around us and whispers continuously echoed in our ears, we ventured further into the abyss of ancient wisdom together, desperate and determined, united by both fear and purpose. One rainy evening, surrounded by scented candles as incantations filled the air, we enacted the ritual that was supposed to set us free. There was no turning back then. Our lives would be forever changed, either by deathly failure or by resounding success. But we had one thing certain. No matter what happened, Nathan and I had each other. We had become brothers, 
bonded by loss and pain but also by hope. That night marked the culmination of our journey and an end to the terror that had befallen us. Or so we thought. I never thought I'd find myself in this situation. It started out like any other day, with me grabbing my usual cup of overpriced, mediocre coffee from the local cafe near my office. My name is Donovan Mitchell, by the way. I work as a criminal investigator in a popular city in the U.S. I'm usually behind a desk all day, but on that particular day, everything changed. I was in the field helping some colleagues investigate an ongoing case when we stumbled upon an unfamiliar scene. We were near a well-known public park when we noticed a group of people whispering and shuffling around hastily. As we approached the scene, it dawned on me that something was terribly wrong here. Ignoring the caution tape and dim flashing lights from police vehicles, we stepped closer to get a better look. There, lying on the ground with blood spatter dashed across nearby foliage, was a body mutilated almost beyond recognition. We exchanged fearful glances as everyone started piecing together what might have happened here. The wound patterns were unlike anything any of us had ever seen. Frankly, I thought it was impossible for such brutality to be so precise. As we inspected further, one of the bystanders told us the tale of kids with unnaturally black eyes terrorizing the community for months, and now it seemed they'd escalated to murder. No one knew their names or where they came from. They were like phantoms preying on unsuspecting victims. Days went by as we tried to track down these elusive children. All our efforts proved futile, until one fateful evening while walking back home after another fruitless day at work. I turned into an alley shortcut that led to my apartment complex when I saw them. Three dastardly figures stood before me. Their dark, hollow eyes pierced through me like needles through silk. Their icy faces held sinister grins as if challenging me to inch closer. I realized, in that moment, that I was their next target. Swallowing my fear and trying to remain as brave as possible, I slowly reached for my secret weapon, a small pocket knife I carried for emergencies. I felt the sturdy metal in my hand and took a deep breath. It was now or never. The attack came without warning. They lunged at me with blistering speed. Fueled by adrenaline, I fought back, slashing and slicing any part of them that made contact with me. Then, just as quickly as it began, it ended. They stared at me one more time, then vanished into the night like shadows on a wall. Bruised and battered, I stumbled back to my apartment and collapsed in bed. Sleep didn't bring relief as nightmares plagued my dreams until morning seeped through the window blinds. The next day, I reluctantly reported the encounter to my colleagues at work, who were shocked but disbelieving. The case spiraled open again as we vowed to find these twisted children and bring them to justice. However, days turned into weeks without any luck. As we continued investigating, we uncovered unspoken stories from many terrified witnesses from the city's fringes, all featuring the same haunting detail, those black eyes. Despite our ongoing search, their origin remained a mystery tucked within the dark secrets our city held close. But one thing was certain, they were still out there, lurking in the shadows and preying upon our community like predators in search of new prey. I still remember that fateful encounter, how their black eyes shone mercilessly as they attacked without hesitation. And every day, as I walked down that same alleyway, hoping for answers or some form of closure, those unnerving questions remain. Who are they? Can they be stopped? But then again, maybe some mysteries are best left unsolved. The caution tape has stood since that day 
and the dimming flashing lights persistently watched the eerie scene where their horror first revealed itself to me. For now, my mission goes on. As a criminal investigator driven by an unyielding desire for justice and resolution, I'll continue searching for those sinister children with pitch black eyes, driven by the hope that one day we might unveil the true nature of this nightmare and put an end to their malevolent reign over our city. Months passed, and the city remained under a dark cloud of fear and uncertainty. An unlikely alliance formed as more investigators and even some ordinary civilians began working together, united by a common goal to end this reign of terror. The media caught wind of the phenomenon, perpetuating an ever-growing state of panic as stories of more encounters surfaced with each passing day. When it seemed like we were no closer to finding the truth about these sinister beings, a breakthrough came from an unexpected source. I received a call from my distant cousin Rebecca, who worked as a historian at the town's archives. She shared an obscure tale that dated back over a century. It eerily mirrored our own incidents involving the black-eyed children. This ancient case had been buried within the dusty tomes of local legends and folklore, and as we delved deeper into our research, we uncovered chilling connections between these past occurrences and our present-day nightmare. By pooling our resources and collaborating with experts in folklore and supernatural phenomena, we slowly pieced together a harrowing narrative that went beyond anything we could have imagined. Witnesses shared detailed accounts of their encounters with the black-eyed children. Their descriptions were strikingly similar to those found in century-old newspaper articles deep in the archives' catacombs. The lines between history, myth, and reality blurred as we raced against time to uncover a way, any way, to stop them. We concocted elaborate traps around the city while attempting to lure these malevolent entities into our grasp. But fate had other plans. For every step forward, it seemed we took two steps back. Nevertheless, our efforts intensified under a collective sense of responsibility, fueled by desperation and hope, even if hope looked like nothing more than reckless defiance. We could no longer ignore these black-eyed children. They had become an uncomfortable part of our reality, perhaps even the darkest chapters of our history waiting to repeat themselves. With each new discovery, we inch closer to a harrowing truth, an explanation for these horrific events that haunted our city for generations. But as the darkness seeped deeper into the very fabric of our existence, we soon realized that our fight had only just begun. All I could think of was how eerily quiet it was that morning as I walked to grab my usual coffee from the local cafe. It didn't quite make sense for a busy area like downtown Sacramento but something about its peculiar emptiness thrilled me. My name is Maverick Sutherland, a 30-year-old software engineer working in the heart of the Californian capital. As I turned the corner towards the cafe, I noticed its door was ajar, strange, considering the owner's meticulous habit of keeping it closed before opening. I cautiously stepped inside and called out to see if anyone was around. Hey, Clem? Is everything all right? You're not usually open this early. A distant muffled noise caught my attention from the back room. It sounded like Clem's voice, only filled with unease. With too many unsettling thoughts running through my mind, I followed the sound and found him on the floor, restrained by duct tape and pleading with panic-stricken eyes. What the hell happened, man? I whispered harshly as we exchanged glances in mutual distress. My hands trembled while I removed the tape bindings from Clem's wrists and ankles. I, I don't know, he stammered, but a group of sinister-looking kids came in here an hour ago demanding money. 
Their eyes were completely black. It wasn't right. We alerted the police about this horrendous incident, unsure whether these wicked children would strike again. Upon further investigation, we found out that those kids had broken into several businesses that morning and terrorized their owners, their dark eyes sending chills down everyone's spine. Within days that turned into weeks, they seemed to vanish into thin air, leaving residents shaken but glad for their disappearance. Or so we thought. The mounting dread peaked when people started disappearing too, friends, neighbors, colleagues, all gone without a trace. During one harrowing night after a friend's house party, I found out firsthand just how dangerous these black-eyed kids really were. As I walked down the empty street towards my apartment, a chilly breeze rustled the leaves, and that familiar eerie quietness enveloped me once again. Suddenly, I spotted them, three children standing in the shadows under a flickering street light. Their eyes were nothing but black voids, and a sinister aura of malice shrouded them. My heart raced as my stomach churned. Never before had I been so frightened for my life. As I hurried home and locked the door behind me, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, as if they could see through the walls. They wanted me, but why? The next day, I spoke with others who had experienced these encounters. We scoured online forums and pieced together stories from other survivors, seeking answers and some closure to this terrifying ordeal. We learned that those black-eyed kids were responsible for a series of gruesome crimes over the years, from arson to murder. They stalked their victims without remorse or fear, driven by an insatiable thirst for violence and terror. In the end, we never discovered who they truly were or where they came from. Some believe they are soulless beings from another realm that feed on fear itself, yet this explanation only raised more questions than it answered. And as for me, to this day, whenever I see a group of children on the streets late at night, my heart plummets to the bottom of my chest as I remember those dark voids staring back at me from beneath the flickering streetlights. So if you ever find yourself alone on quiet city streets with an eerie calm settling in, beware of those black-eyed kids, because even now there could be one lurking just around the next corner. Fortunately, the community's awareness of these dark-eyed children had grown, and people began to take precautions. They'd link arms when walking home late in the evening, avoiding dimly lit streets and alleys, always making sure to never venture out alone. Several surveillance cameras were installed in strategic places throughout Sacramento in an attempt to track and identify these monsters before they could claim any more innocent lives. Little by little, the city managed to regain its sense of normalcy, despite living under this unnerving shadow. Months passed, and not a single terror incident took place. People cautiously began to feel secure and safe in their daily routines again. But deep down, we all knew that this could only be a temporary reprieve. The horror and notoriety surrounding these black-eyed children were etched deep within our collective memory, like a permanent stain upon our city's soul. That feeling of dread intensified on one fateful night when the unthinkable happened, Another person vanished under mysterious circumstances. The victim was a respected software developer and a close friend of mine who had once bravely faced off against those very same heartless beings. The panicked whispers around town made one thing clear. The black-eyed kids were back, and they had returned with a vengeance. As we mourned the loss of our dear friend, our determination to stop these evil enigmas ignited anew. This time we joined forces with local authorities, forming a united front to end this reign of terror once and for all. Together, we delved deeper into the research and folklore surrounding those wicked children in an effort to uncover new strategies for self-defense or even ways to banish them from our lives permanently. 
While we found no definitive answers to their origins or motivations, we did discover one thing. They seemed drawn to those who exhibited fear or vulnerability. So perhaps facing them with courage and resilience could help minimize their influence on individuals. Though standing strong against such darkness is far from easy. No matter how long this battle between light and darkness endures, one truth remains. With each other's support, we can face these horrors head-on and fight for our city's safety with every ounce of courage and determination we possess. And who knows? Perhaps one day, the secrets of those black-eyed kids will be revealed, allowing us to finally reclaim our blessed lives from their clutches of terror. It was another mundane morning in downtown Chicago when my life turned upside down. Sitting down with a cup of chai at my go-to coffee shop, I unknowingly witnessed the start of something sinister. The time is around 7.30 a.m. The date is October 14th. A seemingly normal day, except for the two kids hanging out by the alley across the street. As I sipped on my lukewarm drink, an uneasy feeling washed over me. Something about those kids, their lifeless black eyes and emotionless expressions, was off-putting. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I had this nagging suspicion that they were out of place. Just when I started mentally brushing off this encounter, one of them approached a nearby woman walking her poodle. Our eyes met briefly before she carried on with her daily routine unaware of what was to come. My name is Harvey Cratchow, by the way. A software engineer by trade and a guy born and raised in the Windy City, I never thought my life would change because of two freakish children. The conversation between them seemed innocent enough at first, maybe even sweet. But soon after they started chatting, it took an unnerving turn. The woman's cheerful smile suddenly vanished, as if she'd seen a ghost. After some moments of confusion from both parties, she simply handed over her dog to the kids without saying another word and quickly disappeared from sight. This singular event triggered a series of increasingly bizarre experiences throughout that fateful day. When I left the cafe to head to work, I noticed a tense atmosphere spreading through the city. It was as if everyone could sense something looming but couldn't identify it. Foul language flew between strangers in traffic jams. Colleagues nervously joked about an impending apocalypse. Police sirens lacked their typical urgency and instead seemed to wail constantly on standby. The whole day remained awkwardly tense. While heading home after another long day at the office, I encountered the children once more except this time, either of them was holding the poodle. All that remained of the small dog was a messy pile of blood and fur on the ground near the jagged alley walls. As I approached them cautiously, I could hear them snickering among themselves as if they had pulled off a big prank on the world, something adults would never understand. The atmosphere around them bore humanity's darkest tendencies. My instincts told me to run and get out of there as soon as possible. But curiosity demanded answers. It was in that split second that I chose to listen to my gut and not dig deeper into their twisted mind games. The following day, more reports surfaced regarding similar incidents. It became obvious that these sinister kids were leaving a trail of gruesome acts throughout the city, maiming pets vandalizing homes with their unnerving inscriptions, and causing a local boy's disappearance under mysterious circumstances. All efforts to track them down seemed futile until an old man from a nearby town recalled an unsolved case from decades ago, horrifying stories that involved kids whose eyes were black as night. The similarities between those stories and recent events shook everyone's nerves. 
In the end, we couldn't know who those children were or how their unique power solicited fear and terror in our docile city. Maybe we'll never get those answers. One cold October morning disrupted all semblance of normalcy in our lives, leaving us only with questions and unease. Weeks turned into months, and the incidents continued to haunt the residents of Chicago. The fear that had gripped the city kept everyone on edge, looking over their shoulders and double-checking their locks. Parents held their children a little tighter and whispered prayers before bed, hoping to shield them from the darkness that had befallen the city. I found myself constantly thinking about that fateful morning when I first laid eyes on those children, feeling an overwhelming sense of guilt for not having interceded in some way to put an end to their terrifying deeds before more people were hurt. In my search for answers, I stumbled upon a hidden community of individuals who had experienced similar encounters across the country, connecting through online forums and sharing their chilling experiences in hopes of finding a solution. As we pieced together the clues to these harrowing events, it became evident that the terror these sinister children wrought was nothing new. They were part of something much bigger than we could have ever imagined. And now it was up to us to stop them. I was hanging out at Elmo's Bar a well-known spot in the city. It was one of those evenings where everyone seemed to be in high spirits, laughing and joking around. That was until they walked in. At first, nothing seemed out of the ordinary about them. They were just kids, maybe 12 or 13 years old. But there was something eerie about their presence that made the room grow quieter. As I enjoyed my drink with my friends, I couldn't help but glance over at the strange kids every now and then. There was something off about their eyes. They looked completely black. Even from across the room, I could feel their unnerving stares penetrating my soul. A regular at Elmo's bar named Rodney Jenkins tried to strike up a conversation with them. He always enjoyed getting to know newcomers and finding out their stories. But instead of responding like you'd expect a normal kid to, they just stared him down, not saying a single word. I continued observing from afar as these mysterious children seemed to draw other patrons into their web of intrigue. Then, without warning, chaos ensued. The children immediately turned violent with malicious intent. The youngest one, who we later found out was named Kevin Harris, scratched Rodney's face deep enough to draw blood. Everyone started panicking as the eerie kids went on a rampage, lashing out at anyone nearby without any apparent reason or motive. We fought back with everything we had at our disposal, chairs, bottles, even pool cues. In the middle of this frenzied turmoil, I noticed that one of the kids seemed primarily focused on an elderly woman sitting near the entrance. Despite her terror and confusion, she managed to barricade herself in a room within Elmo's bar. During those tense moments while we desperately held off those malevolent little monsters, people started sharing bits and pieces of information about them. How fear had recently swept through the city as missing persons reports mounted, all vanished under mysterious circumstances with only whispers of the black-eyed kids remaining in their wake. Eventually, we managed to lock the terrifying children out of the bar, but not before several people were seriously injured, some even fatally wounded. As we dialed 911, everyone tried to catch their breath and process what had just happened. A few days later, an unexpected visitor arrived at my apartment. Detective Mason Juarez came with information on those kids with black eyes. He told me that Kevin Harris was a local legend, a child who vanished years ago, leaving a trail of death and destruction wherever he went. But he remained an enigma, 
the reason behind his actions and his ability to continually elude authorities left everyone mystified. I still think about that night at Elmo's bar sometimes, haunted by the chilling memories and unanswered questions. To this day, I wonder who those children with black eyes really were, what drove them to such violent actions, and if they're still out there somewhere waiting for their next victim. Ever since that horrific encounter, I've become cautious and wary of my surroundings, especially when venturing into unfamiliar places. The city itself went on high alert as news of the incident at Elmo's bar spread like wildfire, sending shockwaves of panic among the residents. Remarkably, I formed a close bond with Detective Juarez. Together, we carried out extensive research in the hopes of unveiling any hidden secrets about the black-eyed kids that tormented our city. We delved into old newspaper archives, urban legends, and eyewitness accounts to piece together a puzzle that seemed to have no end. But in our relentless pursuit of answers, we discovered something even darker, an ancient cult that had been around for centuries, dedicated to preserving and harboring these sinister children. With each piece of information we unearthed, the picture became clearer, yet more chilling. Our investigations led us deep into a dark rabbit hole with countless twists and turns, constantly testing our sanity and determination. As we continue to search for the truth behind these terrifying beings, I can't help but wonder if we'll ever be able to truly protect ourselves and our loved ones from their sinister grasp. I couldn't believe my eyes when I first stumbled upon the scene. It was just another ordinary day at the park, the one you could find in Austin, Texas, Zilker Park. I was looking for a quiet corner to read my book, but little did I know what awaited me around one of the bends in the pathway. My name is Theodore Keller's son, but people just call me Theo. That day still feels like a nightmare etched deeply into my mind. I'm a software developer, and apart from coding marathons at work, I lead quite an ordinary life. As I walked deeper into the park, my eyes landed on something unusual. In a puddle beside a trash can lay a weird object, a neon green scarf with some dark spots on it. Ignoring it as yet another piece of litter, I continued on my way. Moments later, though, this feeling of unease washed over me as I noticed two kids following me. Something about them felt off, their hair neatly combed, dressed in old-fashioned suits with leather shoes as if they were heading to church. With a sly grin plastered across their faces, they had unnaturally pitch-black eyes devoid of any emotion. I shrugged off my initial concern and continued on my way while trying to locate adrenaline junkie friends who loved exploring abandoned places like haunted hotels or long-closed insane asylums. Continuing on our weekend tradition, we were set to uncover the secret hiding spots Silker Park had to offer. The playground wasn't far away now. The shrieks of joy and laughter echoing from afar slowly began growing louder. Griffin McCalla and Jolene Trussler, two members of our group, jogged forward in excitement to reach the swings before anyone else could claim them. But as soon as we reached there, amid children's playtime banter and giggles, the uneasy feeling crept back up on me. The black-eyed kids were there too, their sinister smiles lurking in the shadows of the jungle gym. Their unspoken intentions filled the air with tension. We carried on, doing our best to ignore these kids as we explored different parts of the park while cracking jokes and engaging in light banter. However, their constant presence turned our relaxed afternoon into a haunting one. Griffin was the first to have had enough of their unsettling stares, confronting them boldly and demanding to know who they were. It was at that very moment that one of them lunged at Griffin in a vicious attack. 
What happened next felt like a blur. Kids screaming, Griffin struggling for his life, and Jolene panicking while calling for help. The black-eyed children didn't speak. They only grinned wider, as if proud of their horrific actions. The attack left Griffin in critical condition, and we decided to report it to the police. But those kids just vanished. No evidence or traces were left behind. It wasn't until days later, during a conversation with a park ranger, that we discovered those kids' rumored existence. Black-eyed children known for their relentless stalking and brutal harm they'd cause. They're still out there somewhere. I don't know how they came to be or what they truly are. All I know is that one can never be too careful with these evil beings just waiting for their next unsuspecting prey. Ever since that fateful day, our once fearless group of friends has found ourselves looking over our shoulders at every gathering. The memory of that incident in Zilker Park lingered like a dark shadow, and the thought of those black-eyed children still sent shivers down our spines. The laughter and excitement during our weekend adventures were now tinged with apprehension, fearing the moment when those sinister creatures would appear again. As time passed, we began to research and share stories about others who had encountered these beings, trying to understand their true nature and how to avoid falling prey to them. Our group grew closer together, bound by the horrifying experience we shared. We vowed to protect one another from these unknown entities, never venturing alone into desolate places or leaving a friend behind. Despite the overwhelming fear of encountering those black-eyed children again, we drew strength from our camaraderie and continued our explorations in pursuit of happiness and adventure, always vigilant and prepared for the unexpected lurking dangers in the shadows. It all started on a seemingly normal Tuesday evening. I was walking home after a long day at work when I noticed something odd. The streets of Brooklyn were quieter than usual, and it sent chills down my spine. I was entirely unaware that this would be the night that would change my life forever. As I turned onto my block, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. My name is Caspin Hollis, by the way. And as a 35-year-old private investigator, I pride myself on staying keenly aware of my surroundings. Yet, despite my instincts telling me something was off, I had no reason to assume anything other than just another odd day in the city. Later that evening, while munching on some leftover Chinese, my friend Devereux called. He was panicked, telling me his wife Ginevra never made it home from work. Their last mundane text exchange left no indication of distress or any unexpected plans she might have had. We immediately started our search for Ginevra, walking every street nearby and asking people if they had seen her. As we approached an abandoned factory at the edge of our search grid, we heard the faintest scream echo from its depths. Our hearts raced with fear for our dear friend adrenaline pumping as we entered cautiously. The factory exuded a stench of decay and death that nearly overwhelmed us. Strewn across the floor were bloodied clothes and items that appeared to belong to multiple people. Among them were Ginevra's purse and scarf, their gruesome condition confirming our worst fears. As we ventured further into darkness, suddenly a group of children emerged around a sharp corner. They looked malnourished and disheveled but didn't seem afraid or lost. Rather, they were intensely focused on us with pitch-black eyes that felt soul-shattering. Who are you? Devereux shouted angrily. I am Lazalia. A small girl replied calmly, an eerie grin spreading across her face. And these are my siblings. Before we could react, the real terror unfolded. The children lunged at us without warning, 
tearing at our flesh with razor-sharp teeth and nails while giggling maniacally. Their combined strength was unimaginable, as they kept coming with relentless determination, despite our best efforts to fend them off. We fought them, focusing on staying alive and hoping for a miracle. Minutes felt like hours, but somehow we managed to break free from their grasp. Bloodied and beaten, we stumbled upon Ginevra's lifeless body, discarded like a broken toy among piles of victims. We escaped and called the police. As they took over the gruesome scene, we couldn't help but wonder where these seemingly demonic children had come from and what drove them to this massacre. Days later, a local historian shared how fifty years prior, those children had fallen victim to an accursed mining incident near that factory. The townspeople believed they were irreversibly possessed by malevolent entities from deep underground, confined inside that dilapidated building as punishment for their rage-fueled savagery. Goaded into isolation by generations' long fear of retribution and despised by the town, the devious souls residing within young bodies hid in that cursed factory, preying on innocent lives until devoured by bloodlust once again. The memory of black-eyed children still haunts me to this day, a chilling reminder that evil can wear an innocent face, ruthless in its quest for death and destruction. In the aftermath of that horrifying encounter, I could no longer regard my profession as just a job. The carnage I witnessed awakened a newfound conviction within me to protect and seek justice for those who cannot defend themselves from the monstrous forces hidden in plain sight. Devereux, forever changed by the loss of his loving wife, Ginevra, joined me in my quest. Together, we delved into the dark underbelly of our world, uncovering sinister truths masked by society's ignorance and fear. As we unraveled mysteries that seemed better left buried, we honed our skills and prepared for the battles that lay ahead. The scars etched into our bodies and souls serve as reminders of our eternal vigilance against the wickedness preying on humanity. Time and time again, we faced insurmountable odds, each brush with death strengthening our resolve to be the barrier between good and evil. While vengeance initially fueled us, eventually we learned we must also fight not just for retribution but for redemption, seeking to save lost souls from their damning fate whenever possible. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me as I walked into Vegas, a popular bar in downtown Chicago. It was unusually quiet for a Friday night, but I shrugged it off and made my way to the counter, ordering my usual Manhattan. My name is Jamie Willis, and I'm a cybersecurity analyst at a small company. Bar scenes like this are familiar for unwinding after a long week of work. My friends Stephanie and Brian joined me at our usual booth. We settled in, and soon enough, we were laughing and joking just like any other night. When we went outside to smoke, Brian pointed out the graffiti covering the back wall of the bar, something I hadn't noticed before. It consisted of strange symbols mixed in with messy black handprints. It gave me an unsettling feeling, but I couldn't put my finger on why. As I took another drag from my cigarette, a group of kids walked into the alley, five teenagers with exceptionally pale skin and piercing black eyes. They introduced themselves as Cassius, Delia, Atticus, Maya, and Adrian. They had an eerie vibe around them, but they made small talk about how they were new in town and exploring places to hang out. My friends and I didn't think much of our encounter with them until later that night, when an intoxicated man stumbled out of Vega's back door, where we had been smoking earlier. The moonlight cast an unsettling glow on his face, revealing deep gashes along his cheekbones where skin seemed almost peeled away, 
exposing muscle fibers beneath. Our concern turned to panic as we realized the group of kids we had met earlier surrounded him, their mouths smeared with gore from what appeared to be feasting on this poor soul's flesh. As they advanced towards us with predatory grins, we could see unspeakable horrors in their pitch-black eyes that struck fear down to our core. We raced through the streets, desperately seeking an escape from these monsters who hunted us. The city felt like a maze, and every turn revealed images of death and chaos caused by these sinister children. We pushed our way through the streaming crowds, hearing the screams of those who had unfortunately crossed paths with them. Our hearts raced as we attempted to outmaneuver them, but to no avail. Their relentless pursuit left us little room for hope. Breathing heavily and with adrenaline coursing through our veins, we frantically tried to devise a plan to survive this nightmare. It was then that I spotted an abandoned warehouse three blocks away, a potential hideout where we could regroup and try to understand what we were up against. Upon reaching the dimly lit building, we carefully studied the massacre unfolding in the city outside. While the police were struggling to respond to this chaos, emergency services were overwhelmed with countless horrifying reports flooding in. We realized that the evil acts perpetrated by these entities were not exclusive to us. They had terrorized this city in a meticulously orchestrated invasion. As minutes turned into hours and darkness enveloped the city, Brian recalled whispers he'd once heard about ancient lore concerning creatures known as black-eyed children. He went on to detail how they were said to possess supernatural abilities and were notorious for stalking unsuspecting prey, both making use of their sadistic appetite for human flesh. The atmosphere within our hiding place grew heavier by the minute as each one of us tried to process the nightmare we found ourselves trapped within. We mourned the loss of countless lives while being racked with guilt for not recognizing the danger sooner. Days later, we learned from a local priest that modern occultists theorized. Black-eyed children were demonic entities capable of choosing various forms, including those of innocent kids like Cassius, Delia, Atticus, Maya, and Adrian, who injected terror into our once peaceful city. It was only after three agonizing weeks of hiding and evading death that law enforcement finally managed to regain control over the city. The carnage left in the wake of these monsters remains a haunting reminder of how our lives changed forever in the suffocating grasp of their relentless pursuit. Even now, as I recount this harrowing experience, I can't help but wonder if we'll ever uncover the true origins behind those soulless black eyes. In the aftermath of that horrifying ordeal, my friends and I felt compelled to delve deeper into the origins of the black-eyed children. Our research led us to connect with fellow survivors across the globe who had encountered these demonic creatures. We formed a network of individuals who shared a burning desire for answers and a passion for protecting others from this insidious threat. As months turned into years, our group gained recognition as a leading authority on the mysterious paranormal phenomena we had faced. We devoted our lives to studying dark manuscripts, ancient folklore, and unexplained events all to understand and combat the evil that had nearly consumed us. But no matter how much knowledge we gained, an unnerving uncertainty lingered in the back of our minds, a constant reminder that we were never truly safe. We knew that those soulless black eyes would always haunt us, relentlessly watching from the shadows as we tried to rebuild our lives in an uncertain world where trust had become a luxury none of us could afford. And so, our endless battle against darkness continued, fueled by determination and courage, united in our quest to prevent the rise of these monstrous beings once more.
It started at the Oakwood Lounge, a popular bar on the outskirts of a small town in Indiana. I'd been going there for years. It was my escape from the tedious routine of everyday life. The bar had always been a harbor where I could grab a drink, shoot some pool, and forget about my worries for a while. But everything changed that fateful Friday night. Bartender, can I have another beer, please? I asked as Matt, the bartender, slid a cold bottle across the counter. Slumping onto a stool next to me was Frankie Rashida, a co-worker who liked to frequent the bar as well. We were both electricians by trade. After talking shop and downing a couple more beers than we should have, we decided to head outside for some fresh air. We stumbled out into the warm summer night and noticed a group of kids huddled at the edge of the parking lot. Slightly drunk and curious, we approached them to strike up what we thought would be an amusing conversation. As I got closer to them, I saw something odd about their eyes. They were completely black. Hey there, said Frankie with his drunken charm. What are you kids doing hanging around this boring old bar? No offense, one of them replied coldly while staring blankly into our eyes with no emotion on their faces. He had strange black eyes as well, whiteless orbs that unnerved me to my core. The weirdness of their eyes threw us off, but it didn't completely dissuade us from talking to them. You kids ain't from around here, are you? I inquired. My charming introduction was met with monotonous silence. It wasn't until later, when my memory wandered back to this night, that it clicked. All throughout history, reports recounted children nearing strangers with pitch black eyes, otherwise referred to as black eyed kids. I'd always dismissed the stories as mere urban legends a product of overactive imaginations, but now I was experiencing them firsthand. It was in this surreal moment that we first started feeling the fear raising its ugly head inside of us. We didn't pay attention to the ominous feeling grabbing our guts. It wasn't long after that the situation turned from eerie to unthinkably sinister. The next day, Terrified by my encounter and unable to shake off the disturbing image of those dark eyes, I sought out a researcher, Dr. Laura Holloway, whom I managed to track down through various online forums. I remembered hearing her name previously while investigating cases involving supernatural or inexplicable phenomena. When she finally reached us on the phone, she listened cautiously as we recounted our experiences before revealing that there had been recent brutal incidents nearby relating to sightings of black-eyed kids. This knowledge made me shiver even more as all the threads began to intertwine inside my head. It was then that Frankie confided in me something he'd discovered about these encounters. Just today, Reese Crowther, a middle-aged man from Wisconsin, met with an unfortunate fate. He had been sharing his own terrifying experience with these ominous children. But just as he began detailing how he avoided disaster, they cunningly lured him back into their clutches. As the two of us digested this horrifying information, we realized we faced more than a strange, localized phenomenon. We were witnessing a chain reaction of deadly events that would unravel soon enough right before our eyes. A few weeks later, I happened to bump into an old friend who used to serve on the local police force, officer and Caulfield. After exchanging pleasantries, I finally shared my knowledge about what we'd discovered regarding black-eyed kids with her briefly. Caution caused me to withhold certain details. After all these years of investigating crimes and mysteries, she couldn't believe that something so bizarre would be hidden in plain sight. In conclusion, I must say that the mystery of the black-eyed kids remains unresolved. Our encounter with them became a grim testament to the fact that sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Nowadays, whenever I drive by the Oakwood Lounge or think of that summer night, 
I can't shake the image of those kids and their haunting black eyes from engraving deeper into my mind. For those who don't believe, I understand. It's always easier to look away from things that terrify us or seem otherworldly. But whatever you do, if you ever find yourself in front of those pitch black, soulless eyes, I urge you to trust your gut instinct and distance yourself as quickly as possible. Once you've caught their attention, it's easy to be drawn into the darkness of their mysterious world. A world that may hold nightmares far worse than anything our rational minds can comprehend or explain. So if you ever feel that heavy weight of unease, the gut-twisting sensation that screams danger, listen closely and act accordingly. As for me, I'll continue my search for answers, hoping against hope that there will come a day when we can finally understand and possibly even protect ourselves from the ominous presence of the black-eyed kids. It was a Friday evening, just past six o'clock, when I stepped out of my office building in downtown Seattle. My name is Roman Ferguson, a software developer. The streets were bustling with people trying to make their way home or to their favorite bars and restaurants. The sound of laughter and conversations filled the air, but the usual camaraderie felt different that evening. The feeling of unease first hit me while waiting for my bus at the crowded stop. I casually looked around and locked eyes with a young boy standing by himself on the other side of the street. He had jet black hair and alabaster skin that seemed unnaturally pale under the streetlights. But what chilled me to the core were his pitch black eyes. It was as if they were staring right into my soul. When I got home, my roommate Josh noticed that something was off. You look like you've seen a ghost, man. He joked as he cracked open a beer. I told him about the boy with the black eyes and how it made my skin crawl. Josh is not usually an empathetic guy, but even he sobered up upon hearing my story. Over the next couple of days, my encounter seemed to gain more gravity in my mind. The same unusual darkness weaved in and out of conversations at work, in bars, and at bus stops, whispers of children with jet black eyes stalking people across town. Everyone had a different story. Some say they saw one kid, others swear it was a group of them. Late Sunday night, I received a call from an old high school friend named Luke, who worked as a detective for the police department. His voice shook as he told me there'd been a murder investigation at Kent City Park, one that left even experienced officers shaken to their cores. He wouldn't say much more than that over the phone, but I could sense genuine fear leaking through his words. After a sleepless night, Josh and I met Luke at a local coffee shop the following morning. As he sipped his black coffee, he filled us in on the horrifying details of the crime scene. The victim was found with severe lacerations and bite marks. Forensic units had never seen anything quite like it before, as the bite marks were far wider than any human could produce. What happened next took Seattle by storm. Over the course of two weeks, escalating violent incidents left bodies mauled and savagely torn apart all over the city. While official reports suggested a psychopathic killer was on the loose, those in the know whispered fearfully about something much darker, children with pitch black eyes. I became consumed by the thought of finding these sinister creatures, whatever they were. Together with Josh and Luke, we conducted our own off-the-record investigations after having too many sleepless nights and having no other options. We interviewed witnesses whose lives had been shattered by these encounters, researched old police reports that sounded eerily similar to our current reality, and collected newspaper clippings spanning decades from all across the country. 
My world changed one evening when an old woman named Evelyn approached us in a pub where we were discussing our findings. She overheard us talking about the black-eyed children and revealed that her granddaughter, Annabelle Jones, had been abducted years ago. One day she told her mother she was playing with a new friend, a child with eyes blacker than coal, and that was the last time Annabelle was seen alive. Evelyn connected us to others who'd had their lives destroyed by these malevolent children. These survivors banded together to search for answers, not just to help themselves but also to save future victims from a fate they couldn't comprehend. Through months of tireless investigating and digging through dark secrets no one should uncover, we finally discovered that these children weren't humans at all but ancient, supernatural creatures that fed on fear and pain before taking the lives of their unsuspecting prey. Our final showdown with these monsters was a dark and desperate night in that old abandoned prison on the outskirts of town. In a blinding, visceral blur of blood, adrenaline, and pain, we fought against these agents of chaos. Some of us didn't make it out that night, but those who did ensured those black-eyed creatures paid dearly for the terror they wrought upon our city. There's no telling if all of them were defeated or where they came from, but we did enough to send them back into whatever abyss they crawled out of. Sometimes I still hear stories, in hushed whispers, of sightings or unusual happenings in other cities across the country. But one thing is for certain, we in Seattle won't be forgetting those chilling weeks anytime soon. Time has moved on, and what remains of our unusual alliance has disbanded, with each member trying to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives. Josh, Luke, and I still catch up occasionally, over a beer at the local pub or a quiet dinner at home. But we can never escape the lingering shadows that those black-eyed children left behind. And although it's nearly impossible to feel safe again after such horrors, we've learned the true meaning of bravery and unity and vowed to face whatever lurks in the dark, no matter how terrifying it may be. I was sitting at that diner, you know, the one on Main Street, sipping my black coffee as the neon sign outside flickered. It wasn't an unusual Saturday night. I was just catching up on some work, occasionally glancing out the window. Things changed, though, when they walked in. Now, these weren't just your regular group of kids. They were different, and something about them felt eerily off. At first glance, they seemed normal. A couple of teenagers wearing hoodies and jeans were talking in hushed voices. But as they got closer to the counter next to me, I noticed their eyes, pitch black, soulless little orbs that sent a chill down my spine. Their names? I had no idea at that point. As the kids sat down and ordered their food, I couldn't help but listen in on their conversation. What I heard made me shiver, details of some brutal attacks on people around town, innocent folks just going about their lives. The vividness and accuracy of their descriptions were too unsettling to ignore. These encounters all started innocuously enough, a chance meeting while walking late in the evening or an unexpected knock at a door, only to find one of these kids standing there with an unnerving smile. It became clear that they were stalking their prey with cunning strategy and malicious intent. From what they were saying, it seemed like these kids delighted in tormenting those they encountered by displaying violent acts before mercilessly maiming or killing them. I didn't want to believe it at first. Maybe it was just some sick role play? But as I listened more intently, my skepticism vanished. The details they were discussing couldn't be made up. After overhearing one more disturbing story of attack and bloodshed at a family's home nearby, I felt like my heart was about to explode from fear. It struck me that if these kids realized I knew too much, 
I could be their next target. I tried to stay as casual as possible, pretending to be absorbed in my work, but my hands were shaking. As I was formulating an escape plan in my mind, something even more terrifying happened. One of the kids looked directly at me, a sinister smile stretching across his face. He leaned over toward me and whispered, We know you're listening. In that moment, the fear and adrenaline propelled me into action, sending me bolting from the diner and frantically searching for my car keys as I sprinted to safety. As I pulled away with tires screeching, I saw them in my rearview mirror, those black-eyed kids who knew just what terror they were capable of unleashing. The following days were a blur of police reports and sleepless nights. Telling people what I had witnessed would have seemed delusional if it weren't for the recurring attacks around town that matched the tales of violence I had overheard. The cops couldn't seem to come up with any leads or suspects, like these kids were ghosts. Only later did I overhear two detectives discussing what they'd discovered during their investigation. Apparently, these sinister children all shared the same mysterious background. They were adopted by a secretive organization with no discernible motive, save for unleashing chaos on unsuspecting victims. That night at the diner was one that changed my life forever. It made me question everything I thought I knew about our world, just how fragile our safety can be, and the existence of incomprehensible evil. My life after that night had become a constant loop of paranoia and fear. I made an effort to avoid dark alleys and suspicious strangers. As months went by, the attacks started to decrease in frequency and eventually stopped altogether. The police never managed to apprehend or even identify those black-eyed teenagers, and the investigations hit one dead end after another. Gradually, the town returned to its normal rhythm, but for me, the haunting memories remained all-consuming. I became more alert to my surroundings and researched everything there was to know about mysterious organizations with an intent to cause chaos. The experience infiltrated every aspect of my life, changing my daily habits and straining my relationships with friends and family. Sleep was a precious commodity that eluded me night after night as the faces of those teenagers haunted my dreams. Despite these changes in my life, I still sought answers for what had transpired in our town. My research led me down countless conspiracy theory rabbit holes, desperate to make connections and understand the motives behind such evil acts. One day, while discussing my findings with an acquaintance in a local conspiracy group meeting, we stumbled upon a theory that seemed far-fetched at first but was strangely compelling and disturbingly plausible given the inexplicable events I had witnessed. Could it be possible that these black-eyed kids were dark beings or supernatural entities with origins much darker than we could possibly comprehend? As I continued on this journey to uncover the truth and make sense of it all, one thing became certain, life would never be quite the same again. I still remember the incident like it was yesterday, even though it's been a couple of years now. It was a regular evening and my friends and I had decided to meet up at our favorite coffee shop in New York City's Soho neighborhood. Located near the Hudson River and filled with hip boutiques and art galleries, the shop was a popular spot for people our age. We arrived at around 6 p.m. I sat down at a table with my friends, Sophia, Ethan, and Trey, ready to enjoy some delicious pastries and catch up on each other's lives. Unbeknownst to me, that day would change the course of my life forever. My name is Bennett Falconer, an average 26-year-old graphic designer from Brooklyn. Little did I know that my world was about to be turned upside down. As we hung out in the coffee shop, 
laughing about Ethan's not-so-funny work stories, we couldn't help but notice a group of kids outside who seemed a bit off. Appearing to be around 10 to 12 years old with strangely dark eyes that sent shivers down our spines despite being harmless children. Not wanting to seem judgmental or alarmist, we shrugged off our wariness as a rational fear and continued chatting. But soon enough, we couldn't ignore the unsettling feeling any longer when one of the kids, a girl called Adelaide with an icy stare that seemed to pierce right through you, approached our window. At first glance, her actions seemed harmless. She just stood there looking inside the shop. But we quickly felt something deep and sinister lingering beneath her steady gaze. Tension grew among my friends, but we tried not to let our imaginations run wild. As time went by, more accidents started happening in Soho. People were injured or worse during seemingly random incidents involving these black-eyed children, who always seemed to appear on the periphery. They moved through the streets like shadows, always lurking nearby as if stalking their prey. After a few weeks of uneasy whispers and terrified looks exchanged between locals, the situation escalated. My friend Sophia was walking home from work one night when she encountered Adelaide again. Only minutes later, Sophia was found on the ground bleeding and unable to speak. In a horrifying twist, she barely survived the incident but had no memory or explanation for what had happened to her, only Adelaide's name. The incidents grew in frequency and intensity with each passing day. We began searching for any information we could on these black-eyed children, desperate for answers. It seemed as though they possessed an unnatural ability to wreak havoc on our community by toying with people's emotions and causing real pain and injury. Through exhaustive research and harrowing accounts from witnesses, we gradually unraveled Adelaide's story. The girl was a transient spirit somehow connected to the very foundation of Soho itself. There were few records of her beyond old newspapers, which documented a gruesome murder-suicide in a tenement building long since demolished where she had lived. Realization dawned that these villainous children were drawing power from unwitting victims' fear and pain, becoming stronger and bolder with each attack. We banded together to fight back in a desperate attempt to banish their sinister influence. As weeks turned into months, tensions in Soho rose to unprecedented levels. Yet despite the danger we faced daily, our community stood strong, refusing to succumb to fear or abandon hope. It wasn't until much later that we would piece together all the clues that led us to confront Adelaide herself in one final showdown. In a fierce struggle against unimaginable horror, we liberated ourselves at last from the malicious entities that once haunted our lives. Ultimately, life in Soho moved on and gradually regained some semblance of normalcy after that fateful day of confronting Adelaide. Though the city still carries the scars of its brush with darkness, it now serves as a reminder of the power of courage and determination in the face of malevolence. The years that have passed since that harrowing encounter with Adelaide have left their mark on me and my friends. Each of us has grown stronger and more resilient, as if the fight we waged against the darkness united us in an unspoken bond. Although we occasionally bring up the topic, none of us can truly explain everything we experienced during those terrifying months. The black-eyed children and their sinister touch have become a memory vivid but slowly fading into the background along with the rest of our past. Soho has evolved too, with new generations taking to its streets, unaware of the old battles fought for their lives. Fresh art adorns its gallery walls, while trendy boutiques keep drawing fresh crowds to this vibrant hub. While nothing can erase what transpired within its limits, the neighborhood has become a testament to human strength and our unwavering will to protect one another from any lurking evil. As for me, I continue to explore life, 
now with an indelible mindfulness of how fragile and fleeting it can be, forever grateful for whatever force guided us through that dark chapter in our lives. It was out of the blue when a childhood friend of mine, Donovan Kramer, called me up one evening after years of radio silence. He didn't waste much time on pleasantries. Hey, mate. Can I crash at your place for a few days? I need to get the hell out of Dodge for a bit. He begged. This didn't surprise me much. Donovan had always been the kind of guy who accumulated debt and trouble like people accumulate fridge magnets. Sure, I said. Just don't bring any of that trouble to my doorstep. Of course you know me, he replied with an uneasy chuckle that suggested just the opposite. It was the last week of August in 2002, and I had just moved into a new house in San Francisco, so I figured why not catch up with an old buddy. He arrived later that evening, and before long, we were reminiscing about old times over a couple beers. As we talked and laughed, poking fun at each other's choices in life, the evening stretched on uneventfully. As we ventured around the city together over the next few days, people greeted Donovan by name, gym owners, bartenders, even police officers seemed to recognize him. When I asked how he knew all these people, he'd just say we had crossed paths before or brush it off with a grin. On the fourth day, we went for dinner at a local diner that Donovan claimed to love. As we were leaving, he said goodbye to one of the waitresses, Abby Torres, who waved back at him nervously. Just as she turned away from us, something caught her eye near some bushes behind the restaurant. We walked towards Abby as she hesitated before shouting out, Daniel? Is that you? The figure emerged from the shadows, only for us to realize that it wasn't Daniel but Austin Bledsoe, a thirteen-year-old I had never seen before. However, Donovan recognized him immediately as his estranged sister's son. Austin's eyes were a deep black color that sent chills down my spine. He told Abby how a nice man had been keeping him safe, but he couldn't stay there anymore. Abby looked terrified, but she agreed to help, and we all agreed to meet at Donovan's sister's place after work the next day. The next evening, Donovan and I arrived at Helen's house early to explain the situation to her. She could hardly speak but managed to say, Last week, someone broke into my house and Austin was gone. Her eyes widened in terror when I mentioned Austin's black eyes. We all went to the diner together, where Abby led us around the back of the restaurant to an old van parked nearby. Our hearts pounded in anticipation as she opened the door. My adrenaline spiked as I saw ropes tied up where Austin had been restrained just hours earlier. A pile of disturbing drawings depicted gruesome scenes with body parts strewn around and mysterious shadows lurking in the corners, all signed by Austin himself. While we looked closer at these chilling drawings, Abby divulged details, avoiding eye contact with Helen, a local crime boss named Marlon, the Viper. Slate had taken Austin and turned him into a killer's apprentice, teaching him how to stalk, maim, and kill his subjects, hoping one day he'd be just as ruthless and cruel as himself. As Donovan tried and failed to comfort his sister, I realized that nothing would be the same. The discovery of these drawings marked the beginning of a haunting descent into a terrifying world none of us were prepared for. From that moment on, our lives changed forever. As weeks rolled into months, Marlon's slate held an oppressive weight over our shoulders. We struggled to wrap our minds around Austin's actions, driven by an evil so malevolent it would be forever etched into our memory. We could never share the horrid details we discovered, 
and Helen would never accept Austin's actions, always wondering if the truth was far worse than we let on. In an effort to restore some semblance of normalcy, we set out to investigate Marlon's slate and the extent of his criminal empire. It became clear that in order to protect Austin and heal the wounds that had formed in our lives, we needed to dismantle Marlon's operation and bring him to justice. Donovan and I volunteered to do the legwork, gathering intelligence from his contacts around the city while Abby cared for Helen and Austin. As we delved deeper into Marlon's twisted world, we uncovered a complex web of crime, deceit, and violence that had seeped into every corner of San Francisco. In uncovering the dark secrets and transgressions that Marlon's reign had wrought, we felt the oppressive weight of his evil were on our souls, making every step harder than the last. However, despite the odds stacked against us, our shared resolve solidified a bond between Donovan, Abby, Helen, and me, one that only grew stronger as we continued our harrowing quest for justice. It was this formidable bond that would eventually help us weaken Marlin's diabolical grip over the city and rid ourselves of the torment he'd caused in all our lives. Although each day brought unimaginable challenges and tested the limits of our strength and courage, it also brought hope, hope that perhaps one day soon, our collective anguish may come to an end, leaving us free to put these ghastly events behind us and rebuild what was once broken. I still remember that evening like it was yesterday. I was meeting up with my buddies at our favorite bar, the Rustic Raven, after a long day at work. It was just off the freeway in a popular area not too far from downtown. We always liked the laid-back atmosphere and the friendly bartenders, who would often pour us a shot on the house. My name is Lachlan Romero, and I'm a forensic analyst. My job is to collect and examine evidence found at crime scenes which usually involves working closely with the police department. I've always been drawn to true crime stories and had become quite desensitized to violence. Or at least I thought so until that night. As we sipped our beers and traded jokes, I had no idea that our lives were about to change forever. It started with a commotion outside. An argument that escalated quickly as two guys tussled on the ground near the entrance of the bar. We watched warily while trying to mind our own business, but soon found ourselves dragged into something much darker than we could have imagined. The fight seemed to subside as one man appeared to gain control over the other, holding him down with surprising efficiency for someone his size. However, that's when we noticed something strange about him. His appearance wasn't what took us by surprise. Rather, it was his eyes. Two black voids staring into your soul like some malevolent creature from ancient myth. His name became clear later when we heard about similar incidents in town. They called him Ezra Blackwood. At this exact moment, though, all we knew was that those eyes struck genuine fear into our hearts. As bystanders attempted to intervene, Ezra snarled violently, releasing his captive only to leap on one of his would-be rescuers. The scene became chaotic. Blood flowed as teeth met flesh while people screamed and tried to flee. It was as if Ezra had lost all humanity, as if he sensed our fear and desperation, feeding off our panic like a beast from the darkest recesses of hell. The police arrived shortly after, but by that time, Ezra was gone. He had left a bloody trail that led to multiple injured victims on the pavement. The images still haunt me to this day, crying and grasping their wounds, dazed by the sudden brutality they just witnessed. It wasn't until after several statements and interviews that we came to learn who or what had assaulted those people outside the Rustic Raven. 
Apparently, Ezra Blackwood belonged to a mysterious group of individuals known as the Black-Eyed Kids. Their actions seemed almost paranormal in nature, feeding on inexplicable dread and causing havoc wherever they went. During one of my shifts at the police station a week later, I overheard some officers discussing the case. They mentioned that a religious cult leader named Barnabas Crow had been orchestrating the black-eyed kids and using them to commit these violent acts across town. Talk about sinister motives. We never saw Ezra again after that night at the Rustic Raven, but his memory lingers in our nightmares. Despite working in the field of forensics and true crime, nothing could have prepared me for the stark reality of an encounter with pure evil. Some mysteries are better left unsolved, and some names are better left unspoken. For our own peace of mind, we try our best to forget about Ezra Blackwood and the Black-Eyed Kids. Months went by, and our once favorite bar, the Rustic Raven, began to lose its charm. The shadows of that night lingered, casting a dark veil over the lively banter that used to fill the air. Curiosity eventually got the better of me, and I couldn't resist diving into whatever information I could find about the black-eyed kids and their ominous leader, Barnabas Crow. Delving into scattered reports and obscure online forums led me further down the rabbit hole of macabre tales and hushed whispers about their cult-like rituals. Soon enough, my fixation on unraveling the truth behind this phenomenon began affecting my work. I found myself poring over any case file that even remotely resembled Ezra Blackwood's M.O. My fixation didn't go unnoticed by my colleagues, who tried to convince me that it was time to let it go. One day, a mysterious package arrived at my door, unmarked and devoid of any indication of its origin. Inside lay a weathered book filled with ancient symbols and illustrations of rituals that sent shivers down my spine. My heart raced as I thumbed through the pages before landing on an ink-stained page outlining an incantation designed to banish these malevolent beings back to their hellish realm. Armed with this knowledge, I confided in my close friends about my discovery. Our shared trauma had created an inseparable bond between us and after much debate, we decided it was worth attempting the ritual in an effort to rid our city of this nightmarish menace for good. Carefully following the instructions laid out in the cryptic tome, we ventured into a deserted clearing in a nearby forest under the new moon, the very place where Barnabas Crow was rumored to dwell. As we began the incantation, our surroundings seemed to darken even further as an eerie mist crept through the trees. Just as we were about to complete the final verse, that bone-chilling gaze of Ezra Blackwood and the black-eyed kids emerged from the shadows, bearing down on us with a rage-filled intensity that threatened to consume us whole. I still remember that day vividly. It was a cold November evening, and I was waiting on the platform of Central Station in New York City, returning home from a long day at the office. As I leaned against the pillar, absent-mindedly checking my phone, a strange sensation crept over me. I brushed it off as nothing more than exhaustion and tried to focus on the incoming train's announcement. The train arrived right on schedule. The doors opened as commuters hustled out onto the bustling platform. Pushing my way through the throng of people, I finally secured my usual seat by the window and settled in for the ride. Glancing out at the city lights slowly fading into the night sky, I reflected on my past as a detective, remembering all those years living in Nevada before moving to New York. My name is Tristan Larkspur, and I am now just an ordinary guy working a desk job at an insurance company. However, that wasn't always the case. In my former life as an investigator, 
I handled numerous high-profile cases with considerable success, until one nearly cost me my life and forced me to leave Nevada forever. Lost in these thoughts, I didn't notice until too late that something was amiss in our subway car. A subtle unease began creeping among passengers while they whispered nervously and exchanged uncomfortable glances. In moments like these, my former instincts kicked in, and I surveyed our surroundings more carefully. In the far corner of the car stood two teenagers with unnaturally cold features and dark eyes that seemed to bore straight into your soul. The male went by Maxim Volkov. His accomplice was Sarah Finchley, unusual names that seemed eerily out of place in today's society. At this point, we were only aware of their unnerving presence and nothing more until later that night, when they launched their first attack, mercilessly beating an unsuspecting passenger named Eddie Nash over a perceived slight. The subway filled with screams as the two antagonists struck with wild abandon, fueled by some unknown, sinister purpose. I tried to intervene, but they vanished like phantoms into the darkness taking my sense of security with them. Over the next several weeks, the city fell under siege as these black-eyed kids committed more heinous crimes, murders, kidnappings, and assaults, increasing exponentially, leaving law enforcement scrambling to connect the dots. Survivors reported chilling tales of these emotionless predators relentlessly stalking their prey. Being unable to ignore my instincts, I came out of retirement to join my former colleagues back on the force in hunting down Maxim and Sarah. I couldn't help but wonder what drove these once innocent children to become malevolent creatures capable of such atrocities. Was it a tragic past? Brainwashing? Or simply an insatiable thirst for blood? As our investigation progressed, we uncovered a crucial piece of evidence a hidden online forum where members shared real-life accounts of encounters with black-eyed children. This led us to one final post from a user named Orpheus1919, cryptically warning about an imminent attack at Central Station during peak hour in two days' time. Following this lead, we mounted a discreet operation at Central Station on the evening in question. As we tensely awaited any signs of Maxim and Sarah's arrival, we steeled ourselves for their inevitable acts of terror. But nothing could have prepared us for their gruesome entrance, bursting through the crowd wielding machetes and grinning sinisterly as chaos erupted around them. In that moment, everything slowed down as passengers scattered while my teammates and I closed in on Maxim and Sarah, desperate to end their reign of terror. Gunshots echoed throughout the station as we engaged our adversaries. By some twisted luck or divine intervention, Maxim was finally taken down while Sarah, wounding several officers on her path to escape, collapsing against a nearby wall, my mind raced, filled with the screams of terrified commuters and the sounds of gunfire still ringing in my ears. It was finally over, or so it seemed. Weeks later, I learned from an informant who had infiltrated the mysterious forum that Orpheus1919 was secretly Sarah Finchley all along, and Maxim's death was just part of her twisted plan. To this day, she remains at large, both a phantom and a constant shadow hanging over the city. As for me, Tristan Larkspur will never stop searching for the one who turned two innocent lives into a living nightmare. Now back on the force and fueled by an unrelenting determination, I dedicate each day to uncovering the truth behind these dark-eyed monsters and ultimately bringing Sarah Finchley to justice. The experience transformed me as a person. I no longer see life through the lens of an ordinary desk job but as a never-ending struggle against pure evil. Every morning, upon waking up and setting foot in the heart of this scarred city, I remind myself that there are more secrets lurking in its shadows than we can ever comprehend, and my purpose is to continue unveiling them, no matter where they may lead 
or how deep the darkness runs. While New York City may never fully recover from Maxim and Sarah's reign of terror, heroes like Tristan Larkspur will tirelessly work to ensure their conduct remains a chilling memory, not an unchecked reality. It was late on a Friday night in the heart of Manhattan, and the air was thick with the smell of cheap fast food and expensive perfume. New York City was humming like a well-oiled machine, as it always did, but what really made this night stand out was me, Tim Foster, your average 30-something accountant who chose to blow off some steam after a grueling work week. The evening started well enough. I made my way through local bars with friends, enjoying cold brews and sharing laughs. The last thing I remember is that we were at Murphy's Joint near Union Square. I said goodbye to my now wobbly companions around 2 a.m. before stumbling towards the subway station to catch my ride home. As I swayed down the sidewalk, fighting off and pending vertigo, I noticed something peculiar. A young couple approached me at an odd time for pedestrians considering the hour. It wasn't until they got closer that the unsettling chill began to crawl up my spine. They were just kids, teenagers, maybe 14 or 15. But those eyes are black and soulless, like a pair of obsidian stones. Hey, mister, the boy said in an eerily calm voice. Do you have a light? His name was Simon Bryce, a name that still haunts me to this day. I paused for a moment, reluctantly fumbling through my pockets before handing over my lighter. There was something unnerving about these kids that I couldn't put my finger on. Was it their unseasonal black clothing? Their odd request? Or maybe it was seeing two kids roaming around this late at night? As Simon lit his cigarette, and handed it to the girl beside him, Eliza Crawford, whispers reached our corner of the street. A group of four men in hooded jackets had rounded into view. We shouldn't be here, Eliza murmured nervously under her breath. I looked back at them, then back at the approaching group, sensing an impending danger I couldn't understand. My instincts told me to leave immediately. But as I watched the others draw closer, I knew I couldn't abandon these two young souls. Tensions escalated rapidly when one of the hooded men lunged forward, grabbing Simon by the collar forcefully. They demanded money, and fearing for their lives, Eliza pulled out her wallet and handed over some cash. But it wasn't enough to satisfy their sick appetites. Out of nowhere, Simon let out a guttural growl, and his eyes darkened further. In one swift movement, he lunged towards the attacker with inhuman speed and strength. The sound of bones crunching and screams filled my ears as Eliza revealed a wicked grin. Panicked shouts from other pedestrians echoed down the street with each vicious attack from those no longer innocent kids. It felt like being ensnared in a nightmare. Part of me wanted to run far away from this horror show, but another part was frozen in place, unable to comprehend what was unfolding before me. Finally, the hooded men lay lifeless on the ground, their bodies mutilated beyond recognition by Simon and Eliza. The taste of bile mixed with sheer terror crawled up my throat as they turned back to face me. Eliza casually took one last drag from her cigarette before flicking it into the carnage beside us. The scent of burning fabric reached my nostrils as she leaned in close to my ear and whispered chillingly, Thank you for the light. Without another word, they disappeared into the darkness together, leaving behind a trail of death and unanswered questions that still haunt me to this day. Weeks later, I found myself glued to an online article about Simon Bryce and Eliza Crawford, a pair of runaway teenage sociopaths who were suspected in a series of grisly murders across the country. 
leaving a trail of darkness wherever they went. Their demented rampage continued, even after my own encounter. And despite the nationwide manhunt, they were never caught. To this day, I am haunted by their names, Simon Bryce and Eliza Crawford. I wonder what horrors they unleashed upon others and if I could have somehow prevented them. But most of all, I wonder about their chilling eyes, those obsidian pools, and pray that I'll never see them again. Years have passed since that terrifying encounter, but the fear and shock of that night cast a harrowing shadow over my present life. Tim Foster, the once fearless and fairly amiable accountant, has grown a paranoid shell of a man. I started attending support groups for surviving victims of violent acts, desperately seeking solace and ways to cope with the overwhelming guilt. In the confessional calm of these meetings, I found a kindred spirit in Janet Halloway, a woman who also encountered Simon and Eliza on a hauntingly dark night quite similar to mine. Over coffee and shared nightmares, we began to piece together fragments of Simon and Eliza's origin story, desperate to find an answer to our perpetual torment. As Janet and I delved deeper into the lives of our tormentors, we stumbled upon whispers of a secret society known as the Children of the Eclipse, an order believed to have groomed young minds like Simon and Eliza with a twisted worldview and supernatural abilities. While skeptics dismissed these claims as mere urban legend, some claimed this group wielded power far beyond anything comprehensible to ordinary people. It was during this investigation that Janet suggested an idea both thrilling and treacherous. What if we were able to penetrate this enigmatic society, expose their sinister intentions, and bring justice to their victims, including ourselves? Though the idea sent chills down my spine, I was unable to resist the all-consuming desire for answers. Our decision transported us down an ever-darkening path where the lines between good and evil blurred beyond recognition. We submerged ourselves in the world of clandestine meetings in abandoned churches and secret rituals under bone-white moonlight, gambling with time, our sanity, and our lives to hold back this malevolent tide threatening humanity. Whether searching for redemption or retribution, Janet and I became unlikely warriors in a battle against darkness, hoping one day we would conquer our demons, both within and around us. Little did we know, even deeper secrets awaited us, eclipsing the truth we so desperately sought. 